Viewer discretion is advised. Well, it appears as if it's blue skies with wonderful white clouds this afternoon. And this is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Safari Live for our Sunset Safari. My name is Byron and on camera with me this afternoon is of is of course Craig or Batman. Um, we also have Taylor in the tent this afternoon with Inno Censure, our new camera man slash woman, camera woman. So Inno Censure is filling in and helping us out in the tent this afternoon again, which has been fun. And then of course the ladies in the final control. And then a big warm welcome to all of you. It's always nice to have all of you on Safari Live with us. Don't forget, we are completely live. So send us your questions and your comments. Hashtag Safari Live is how you do that. And we'll gladly answer them. Now, I'm approaching this dam. And this is where Taylor managed to find young Hosanna, a young male leopard this morning. So I'm going to see. Hopefully, he's still around. Now, there were apparently tracks of a female in this area too so I wonder if there isn't another leopard around here it's actually been a cool afternoon so I wouldn't be surprised if this leopard did decide to move so we'll have to have a good little look around here um, all right I think let me have a good look I might just walk around and see if I can't find any tracks let's head to Taylor so she can say good afternoon to you And welcome again, as Byron said, to Safari Live, a live and interactive safari. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Innocentia. And, well, hopefully we're going to find all sorts of things, and perhaps we'll have a look at some clips a little bit later, too. Now, as you know, the tent is, can be quite difficult at this time of the year because there isn't really much in terms of insects and things out here. It's particularly quiet. Now, I have got something, however, to show you on the microscope. So if you'd like to go to the microscope, you're welcome to. And then we can investigate and see what I've got. This is a piece of grass that I managed to find outside. I'm just trying to move it around because there's all sorts of things in here. Just bear with me. I'm going to pull it out very quickly and try and turn it around. It's very windy all of a sudden. I, at one point I thought the monitors were going to blow uh, off the table and out into the bush. Uh, there we go. Now, if you look very carefully in there, you'll see that there's a variety of insects. There's a piece of grass. It's... Um, it has a little spider in it now. I'm going to try and find the spider, but look at all the things that it's eaten. There's, there's very little life out there at the moment. One of them on the right looks like a termite, that orange thing. And if I change the focus, there's like a little midge of some sort. You can just see in the top middle of your screen. Isn't that quite beautiful? Look at those wings. But now you might be able to spot the spider in between all that sort of... Well, death, I suppose you could call it. You might be able to see something moving. It's a very small spider. I don't know what it is. It's beautiful, though. Let me see if I can turn it around again. It's, you can see it's just moving over there. It's got beautiful hairs on it. And it's got quite a dark sort of head and dark legs. Let's see if we turn it. I actually didn't even see it with my eyes, to be honest. If I angle it like that, what are we going to get a view? It's very difficult. And now the wind, no wind, stop blowing. Oh, there we go. I think we can just going to see it now. Let me just change the focus here. Yes, okay. Now I'm going to work out how to bring it closer to the screen. Ah, oh, so difficult to work this microscope. There it is. Ooh, look at it. 
I wonder if it's not a very small hairy field spider. They're quite common out here. We see them all over the show and they're related to all web spiders, but then it's its web is slightly different because what it's actually done, it's, it's done, maybe it's not even a hairy field spider, perhaps it's something else. It might be even too difficult to try and identify because there's quite a lot of obstructions. It might be the size of two or three pin heads put together. That's how tiny it is. Isn't that amazing? And it, like I said, it's done a different type of a web. So it hasn't built a, a normal orb round web. It's actually taken the pieces of grass and pulled them together and then used a very fine silk almost like a netting and wrapped it around the grass so that's where it lives, it lives inside the middle of the web and that web will also help protect it it will stop um, anything sort of blowing into it so it's quite safe in there and then it's got all its little insects trapped on the outside let me change the focus a little bit oh that's so amazing I could honestly stare at this for ages that is so cool. I really want to try and figure out what spider we have underneath the microscope, but I might have to do a bit more playing around. Maybe if I do some digging I'll, outside, I'll be able to find some some more spiders for you, hopefully. Well, that that's the idea, of course, today. But if there's anything that you'd like to have a chat about, you're welcome to hashtag Safari Live. Let us know, and you can help me keep myself and you all entertained in the tent because it's very quiet in here, unfortunately. And hopefully the, the ladies in Final Control can dig up some footage for me of uh, the uh, buffaloes and lions and we can have a chat about that because that's definitely been a hot topic over the last few weeks. There's also a car alarm going off. Well, I think this is a good time then to go back to Byron and see if he's had any luck with those leopards. Unfortunately, not yet, Taylor. We are looking, though. That leopard definitely moved off, as I thought, as I thought it would have. These young leopards move around a lot during the day, a lot more than we think. And especially today when it was so much cooler. So we're just going to have to have a careful look around here. I'm going to check this drainage line very carefully because I think if anything maybe he moved up into this area somewhere it's tricky and we know like even this morning with them trying to track him they walked they were so close to that leopard and he, he didn't even move so it's not easy to find them if they are lying down especially when the grass is like this uh, this color and very well camouflaged We'll have a look around there and see. Maybe, maybe we get lucky. I'm sure they are still around here somewhere. I say they. If that's assuming there's two leopards in this area. Check the termite mounds. Check some of the trees. Maybe we're lucky. Wouldn't it be great to see a leopard in a tree? I haven't seen a leopard up in a tree for quite some time. Hope you're having a great weekend everybody, or the end to a good weekend. And, uh, and just a reminder, so there's going to be a time change, and it is from the 1st of August. So from the 1st of August, there is a time change with our sunrise safari. We are going to be half an hour earlier. So half an hour earlier for our sunrise safari. So we are going to be live from 6 o'clock on, uh, so that's 6 o'clock or 6 a.m. Central African time. Sorry, Craig. I feel like Rusty's shocks are no longer exist, um, in existence. So that's from the 1st of August. We're still trying to work out, and we will let you know if we're going to be changing the Sunset Safari, um, the times for the Sunset Safari, but we will let you know. But from the 1st of August, time change for the Sunrise Safari at so half an hour earlier. Come on, there's got to be a leopard on these termite mounds here somewhere.
able to check this little pan very carefully. Nice cover um, and it's a perfect little spot for leopards to hide, young leopards especially. But I have no idea which direction they would have gone or he would have gone. You see anything yet, Craig? I can see some Franklin moving through the grass, but no sign of a leopard just yet. Lovely cool afternoon. So he's this leopard could also potentially be lying out a little bit more in the open, maybe not necessarily well hidden. But you never know. So I'm going to be doing a few loops around here and just see if we can find this leopard. It's times like this I really wish I had my friend Judas that I used to work with. Such a great tracker, a lot of experience, and he just uh, just had a sixth sense when it came to finding finding leopards and tracking leopards. I have no doubt if it if he was with me now, we probably would have had the leopard already. Oh, James, as you were saying, it would have been nice to see um, Hosanna this afternoon. And hopefully he, was, he would be where he was left this morning. That's what I was hoping for, James, but he definitely moved away from there. So I don't know which direction he went. Trying to have a careful look. Any signs, any tracks, anything like that. But I do think he's somewhere in that area. I don't think he would have moved too far. But you never know with these young leopards. Especially this young male, um, he's, you know, he's, he's independent now, he's moving around a lot more, but, um, but still exploring the area, not, uh, not really quite sure what to do. He's still very young, he's only about a year and a half, almost a year and a half old, so still young. Usually, this is the time that, um, that females would probably leave their cubs, is once they get to a year and a half old, that's usually the average age for leopards to reach independence. But uh, in the case of this young male and young female, Hosanna and Shongile, um, their mother left them a lot earlier, at almost just, well, I think they were just over a year old. So that's quite young, but they've done well for themselves. They've survived, which is wonderful. And I mean, we saw this young male, um, this morning we watched a clip on it too. Ali found him wrestling or kind of wrestling or playing tug of war with a hyena over a impala carcass so he's clearly not re really afraid of much there's one impala back there and sometimes all it takes is just driving very very slowly and scanning Stormy C, you asked if I can check on the genet for us later. I will indeed, Stormy C. I wonder if that genet is still in the tree. It would be lovely to see that little genet again. One of my favorite little nocturnal creatures, definitely the genet. Speaking of nocturnal creatures or animals that are active at night, last night um, I was... Uh, I was lying in bed and heard these footsteps outside and, um, and thought it might be Batman heading out on his nightly watch, but it wasn't Batman, it was a hyena that, uh, that was walking through our camp, came to see if the dustbin was out. I had to chase the hyena off last night.
I'm just trying to check very carefully to see if I can see any tracks around here, but nothing yet. It's interesting when this leopard was a bit younger, when this young male was younger and the female would often leave the female would often leave um, Hosanna and Shungila or Karula would leave them and um, and they would often lie on top of termite mounds. Now leopards enjoy lying on top of termite mounds. It's a little bit more comfortable than just lying in a tree and also gives them a nice vantage point to have a look at around and see where um, or if there are any animals around or it's just a nice little spot to lie but, uh, but they haven't done it for or I haven't seen seen him lying on a termite mound for quite some time see I haven't seen any tracks along the road so that just makes me think again that that this leopard must have gone and um, and walked up the drainage line, possibly. Well, I suppose it could have walked up or down. Omkar is speaking about that a hyena raiding the dustbin. He asks, is it safe? For the hyenas to eat or animals to eat from the dustbin so ideally no um, you know it's not a good idea for them to eat from the dustbins but the hyena scavengers they eat just about anything um, I've seen a hyena chew through a steel kettle that you those stainless steel kettle you put them on uh, on a fire when you go camping I've seen a hyena bite through half of that um, incredibly powerful jaws and they'll eat just about anything but um, but no, technically not. So that's why we try to put the dustbin in the um, in the kitchen during the the, the the evening, just to try keep the the hyenas at bay. But they don't come in every night. Uh, that hyena I haven't heard or seen a hyena um, for quite some time. But heard it last night and walked out, and there it was. really hope I get to find this leopard for you. Just gonna take a little drive down here quickly just to scan this area. I'm not sure if he is down here or not. It's a nice thick area here so it's perfect for this leopard to hide in. Keep your eyes peeled, everyone. That's why sometimes <laughs> it's amazing and it can get a bit frustrating at times. Can drive around and come around the corner and bump into a leopard right in front of you. And then other times you can drive to the spot you last saw the leopard, hoping that it would be there, and there'll be absolutely nothing. And then you can search for hours and not find them. See, I was hoping you would have moved into this area somewhere just off to our left.
and this uh, substrate or this soil around here is actually very hard. This is almost like a mud clay or clay like soil. So it's very, very hard. Um, it wouldn't be easy to see tracks on this actually. Hold on a second, I just want to speak to Rexon. So I'm just listening to update from the other guides quickly. Good afternoon, mobile stations. I'm Byron here. Uh, Henry and uh, and Rex and uh, I'm just at Treehouse Dam at the moment, uh, trying to follow up. No sign of that animal just yet. I am checking the area quite carefully. Sounds like maybe one or two people might be interested in coming to have a look around to see if they can see this leopard or find this leopard with us. All right, well, Taylor's still in the tent. Oh, she's going to be there all afternoon, so <laughs> um, we're going to have a look around here. Let's head back to Taylor and see what she's got planned for the afternoon. I haven't exactly got anything yet. I apologise. I'm on. I'm now sort of look quite short, don't I? I'm not on the chair. I'm just down on the ground. I'm trying to reopen everything that I'd had open. Unfortunately, I had to do a massive reboot just now. I don't know what happened. All my feeds started disappearing. And okay, well we won't be able to do that now. Then we'll just have to close all of this. Um. Yes, I would really like to talk about lions versus buffalo today at some point, um, just because uh, it's one of the things that I actually prepped for the tent, um, going into depth and hopefully looking at some sightings that we had last year uh, with the well, incredible Nkuhumas, as they were known at one point when we used to see them every single day. Remember, I think it was 100 days of cats. Doesn't that sound familiar? Remember how fantastic that was? And that, of course, was because the buffalo. We're back and we're around and now we're waiting for them. But we will we'll get into that hopefully if we can dig up some uh, some of the many thousand clips that we do have. What we do have though, we can have a look at the microscope. I managed to find... No, that's a gate. I heard a high-pitched squeaking noise this time. It's not anyone playing soccer. Sure, let me just turn. Chantal's voice is very loud in my ear today. So have a look at that. It's a little pod. Now it's from a, the Monkey Pod Center. You may remember yesterday Byron had that beautiful sighting of uh, the go-away birds and also the crested barbets. They were feeding on the beans. Now, this one is slightly rotten and looks like something had actually uh, started eating away at it. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it would be, um, but it definitely must have had quite a strong mandible um, to pierce through that. It's not big enough for it to sort of to be damaged from a bird. It's just a tiny little spot. So I think it was an insect of some sort. Uh, but isn't that absolutely beautiful? Look at all the tiny little hairs that are actually on that. Let me see if I change the focus up slightly what else we can get. No, that's really it. But see, it's completely hollowed. It's completely rotted it out. Now, you can come back to me and we can have an a actual look at one. I just broke the the rotted part off. Uh, it's quite an interesting little pod. I get quite long uh, down over here. Now there's quite a few center species in in the country that are not actually supposed to be here, but we have a couple uh, that are all right. Well, the birds don't seem to mind them because they provide some nice fruit, delicious things. Now, I don't know if you can even eat these. I'm just trying to think. I've never heard of anybody uh, being able to eat them, so we'll have to pop it into the interweb to have a look. Let's see if I can get one out. It looks very much just like a pea. Let's see. Oh, they're quite small. So it's quite difficult to sort of handle. <clears throat> Sorry. I have something now tickling my throat. Look how tiny that is. So that is the entire little bean that you can see. 
And that is what the go-away birds and the crested barbets are actually going after. Now you can imagine you need to eat quite a few of those to be able to get any sustenance. I'm sure they've got a decent nutritional value to them, so it'll be quite healthy for the birds and for anything else that's really feeding on them. Now I've got something else we can even put under the microscope. Let me quickly change it. This is quite cool. <laughs> Should we have another look at the microscope? There we go. Look how cool that is. That also makes for a great screensaver. Yesterday we put up the goal of a silver cluster leaf. Now this is a guari leaf that a caterpillar has got hold of. You can see it's not any fresh damages. It actually happened quite some time ago. You can see how dried out it's, uh, the dead parts of the leaf are now. But it's just amazing. And I think, let me change the, uh, change the height of it so we can get a better view. Let me sure to change the focus. That is just absolutely amazing. Now, if you look at the size of a caterpillar and the damage that they can do to trees, it's pretty amazing, don't you think? And they do, cre do create beautiful sort of patterns. Something what I will do is I'll go outside and see if I can't find a leaf that has been attacked by a leaf miner. Now, they make all sorts of interesting patterns too, but they sort of seem to do it inside the leaf. They don't actually break the outer layer of, of the leaf at all. So it's almost like they uh, create little see-through parts, tunnels, uh, through the leaf itself. So that'll be quite pretty, so I'll have to go and explore and see if I can find any of those. I'm also trying to dig out an antlion so that we can pop it under the microscope and hopefully have a look at the antlion at some point. But I thought that was quite nice. What else have we got here? We've got some bark which I'm collecting, I'm, but I'm not going to talk about the bark of the various trees just yet because I'm still trying to make a decent collection. The m most common trees that are outside the tent are silver cluster leaves, guaris, and there's some square raisins, and that's really it that's around here, a couple of bush willows. So I might have to do a bit of exploring to go and get some marula bark, maybe some knobthorn bark. I might have to actually walk out onto quarantine to go and grab those things. And hopefully we'll find some. I'll also try and turn over a couple of logs. Because it is a little bit cooler, we know that the insects aren't uh, necessarily too active. And what I'm hoping to find when... Oh, that's so loud. Um, hopefully I'll be... Sorry, I just had to turn that down quickly before I pierce my eardrum. And hopefully I'll be able to find a scorpion. Wouldn't that be nice to have a look at a scorpion under the microscope? I think we could be lucky if we peel back some bark and we turn over some big logs. But we're going to go back to Byron. He's searching far and wide for leopards. Surely Hosanna couldn't have gone too far. He is a sneaky cat, though. It seems as though he's taking after his father. But let's go back to Byron and Craig. We are indeed, Taylor. I hope you find some interesting little creatures under the bark and under those logs. Uh, we have got, we've had no luck just yet. But it's still early, so maybe, just maybe, we get lucky. What was that? <laughs> When leopards go hiding, why do they do that? I suppose if it was easier, we'd lose the, the thrill of looking for these animals. Again, it is very tricky and to drive, try to scan and look for tracks is very difficult and I'm almost certain that we miss a lot of the tracks of these animals. And I've been doing this long enough that even, even with the track on the front of the vehicle at times, we miss tracks. And all it, all it takes is for a track just crossing the road. doesn't necessarily mean that they're walking straight down the road. It could just be one or two tracks crossing the road. And if we don't see that, 
you were looking completely in the wrong place. So it is difficult, it's very difficult. But who knows, they're probably hiding in a drainage line somewhere. What we can also do is maybe drive around a little bit and come back into this area a little later. Maybe we have more luck then. But for now, there's absolutely no sign of that leopard. So I don't know where he would have gone. It's also a little, a little windy this afternoon. There's a bit of a, a breeze. You can see some of the trees moving in the wind. And right, let's just do one more, one more loop back and just have a look again. You never know. Often persistence in the bush pays off. I might, um, I might go check uh, that area or check Chitra Chitra Dam again this afternoon. We had a lot of luck there yesterday. Those two hippo fighting, that was amazing. Really, really incredible to see. And um, we had a question yesterday, speaking about the hippo, we had a question from Chitty Chatty Meg asking if the hippo are related to whales. Now, I thought that that's very bizarre. What, what are the chances? But apparently, apparently, um, archaeologists believe that the whales, porpoises, dolphins, and hippo are all related. And that whales are distant cousins of hippos. Now, I find that absolutely bizarre. And, I mean... I think if you're going that far back, everything's basically related. <laughs> Perhaps. But, uh, I mean, if you, like millions of years ago, they reckon there was a dinosaur and it weighed about 100 pounds or something and it was whale like and hippo like or something like that. Uh, I don't know. That's just, I mean, that's going too far back, I think. I think the animals have evolved in such a way that if you're nitpicking that much to say that they're related anything can be potentially related it's like it's basically like saying James and I are distant cousins imagine that <laughs> so badly want to see a leopard stick its head out and surprise us. Let's do one more check down here. See, like I say, potentially could have gone anyway. Oh, Rusty, please don't bend a steering rod today. All now I've had seriously bad luck with Rusty and the steering rods. It's not from bad driving, I promise you that. 
it's um it's just for some reason it's got a weak steering rod the the support that is meant to be there isn't there so i'm so careful not to bend this another steering rod come on craig we need to spot a leopard funny it's almost like this temperature doesn't know what to do the afternoon it's cool and then now it's warm again I think as soon as the Sun gets away from those clouds then it's warm Lovely termite mound here and some nice trees, a lot of shade. Perfect little spot for a leopard actually. Oh, could always just send Craig in on foot and wait for something to happen. I'll film Craig. Now I see the vehicle tracks over here and I'm not sure if that leopard moved and people followed it this way or if this is just vehicle tracks from them searching for them this morning. I don't know. I see there are tracks here. Now Riti, you ask him about carnivores and what they feed on and if they eat the bones of the... Ooh, I've got a frock there, sorry. <laughs> I thought they are going <laughs> to... Sam Franklin gave me a fright. I thought they are going to fly straight into the car. Let's see, on, on edge here looking for this. <laughs> Riti, you asked if the... Carnivores feed on the bone or, or bones of the predator of the food that they eat. Um, Riti, you know, a lot of the time they do, but it's it's mostly those um, it's mostly those uh, smaller bones, not the big bones, not the really really large bones. Uh, the the hyena hyena probably feed on on the largest bones out of all the carnivores because they've got such powerful jaws. So they definitely do feed on just about anything or as many of the bones as possible. Whereas leopards will feed on maybe the smaller rib bones, some of the other small bones. And you can often hear them crunching away when they are feeding. You hear them crunching on the bones and it's also, they do get a lot of nutrients, a lot of calcium and phosphorus from that. You're laughing at me, Craig. Craig's laughing because I stole the vehicle. It's a log, Craig. <laughs> oh no, Craig's teasing me about. <laughs> well, it's the most emotion we've seen from Craig for about three days, so that's good. <laughs> Now we um, we were chatting about the tent and that this morning, and it's um, and we've had a lot of help from Innocentia filming for us in the tent, while Taylor and I have shared the tent responsibilities. And um, Tristan sent us a message this morning when he woke up bright and early at about 10 o'clock. <laughs> he, he's on leave, so he deserves it. Um, just saying that uh, the tent seems to be a hit and it has been fun. 
Oh dear, you know what? I'm getting myself into a bit of trouble here. It's quite thick around here now. You know what everyone, I've had no sign of these leopards. I don't know where they have gone, all this one leopard that was here. I'm not sure if there were two. Let's just try to squeeze through here perhaps. Oh, there's a Steenbok. Is there any gap through here? Oh dear, I definitely seem to be getting myself deeper into in trouble here while looking for these leopards or leopard. Jan, Eric, you asked if uh, leopards eat anything other than just meat. Well, Jan, um, I suppose if you just meet, yeah, I mean, they, they feed on fish. We know that. We've seen them catching catfish in muddy waters before. Um, we've seen them, I've seen leopards feeding on snakes. I've seen leopards feeding on birds. Uh, I've seen leopards feeding on tortoises and terrapins. Uh, if you mean do they do they snack on the odd fruit no I've never seen a leopard eat a fruit uh, seen them chewing grass but much like um, pets cats and and dogs they'll eat grass if they if they um, was suffering from indigestion or helps the digestive system or will cause them to regurgitate something so, um, so I've seen, you know, the cats do that too, the big cats do that too. But a uh, wide variety of food for the leopards, they'll feed on just about anything. Just want to listen to the radio too, see what the other guys are looking for this afternoon. See, there's some other guests out at the moment on this afternoon safari and they're probably watching us wondering what we are doing in this area. Would be great if we found the leopard and at least they we had a good reason to come through here, but no sign. Like I say, we don't really know which direction he could have gone. He could have gone north, could have gone south. All right, well, I think what we might do is move out of this area. We'll probably try to come back a little bit later. Maybe when it gets cooler, if the leopard's still in the area, it'll stick its head out and maybe move around for us or come down to drink. So let's head back to Taylor in the tent while I get out of this area. everybody I've been running around outside trying to find things well to talk about I don't have a fossicker in chief I am the fossicker in chief I suppose I suppose James dubbed me with that and well now doing all the jobs right so I've been looking outside let me just pick up some of the stuff that I was looking for he's got to scoop it back in my hand now goes once that's what I'm looking for and if you look at just in the palm of my hand you'll see that there's some very very small bits of dung Isn't that tiny how small they are. So I have a question for you. Can you guess whose dung that is? Who dung it? Hashtag Safari Live with your guesses and then we shall 
go into it. You've got to be quick though. This should be an easy one. Very, very easy one. Okay, let me put it down. Now, there's something else that I want to have a look at. What else have we got? So I'm actually going to take that dung away because we'll get back to that in a moment. Hmm. Look at this. Now, this is a type of bracket fungi, as you can see. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to be doing too well. It's also winter, so it's um, <clears throat> not absorbing a lot of nutrients, unfortunately, from its, from its host. But this one is known as orange tuft. And I've actually found it around here before. It likes to grow on the knob thorns. Should we put it under the microscope and have a look? Let me see what it actually looks like. Oh, that's pretty cool. Look at that. Now you can actually see the hairs. Now, we've looked at it before when it was a lot softer than this and a lot more pliable too. Oh my goodness, all my dung is rolling around. The wind is blowing it everywhere. And it's actually quite toxic, this stuff. I believe that it, um, it can be used to enter a trance-like state. I suppose if you're trying to contact your ancestors, it would be a, a good spot to try, or a good stuff to try and use it. However, I'm not going to be eating much of it, but it's very, very pretty. Now, see if I can find some other type of fungi that's out and about. There is, or there, there used to be at one point quite a bit of it, but I don't know where it's all disappeared. It's, uh, I've forgotten the, about the things around the tent, and I also tried to turn over quite a few logs, but unfortunately, no luck there. So, any, any guesses just yet as to um, who dung it? Surely, there must be. Do you think you could read them to me, please, uh, Chantal? That's a bit difficult to grow over to the document. Uh, so, say that again. Karen says, Karen says squirrel. That's a good guess. Very, very good guess. But unfortunately, no cigar. That is, it is not from a squirrel. Ooh. Now, Phil and Jenny Animation, you say a bird. Nope. It's not from a bird, but good guesses, though. Remember, if it was from a bird, you would actually see quite a bit of uh, white from the, the uric acid. But you can see that this lacks any white at all, and it's very small. Any more guesses? Another good guess. Kestrel fox, you say scrub hair. It isn't. But you've just given me something else to go and look for, Kestrel Fox. That's what I'm going to go and find. Oh, another great guess from uh, Wella Find You Say Mongoose. Not quite mongoose, but mongoose is similar shape, though. But mongoose, can you believe it, is actually slightly bigger than this. Well, I think there might be one or two right answers. Um, but we'll just go ahead and I'll just tell you what it is. This is actually Dacre Dung. Can you believe it? All of this stuff here. Now... Isn't that amazing? Now, the reason why it's not Stienbork dung is because it wasn't buried. Typically, Stienbork will bury their dung, and then you'll have to sift it out from the sand. So this is from the Dacre. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to perhaps chat about some of the smaller antelope that normally hide away in, uh, in the long grass. But now that all the grass is, of course, dropping down too well, below knee height, we're starting to see them. And I've been seeing lots and lots and lots of dacre, lots of Stienbork out and about coming down to drink from the watering holes now. And you remember, because all the little pans, pretty much most of them have actually dried up now. Like I said, chile pans completely dry. It's just mud. They're coming down to the dams that are full, which is exciting. I know it sounds absolutely silly, but you don't often get to see those small antelope out in the open. They feel very vulnerable. And this is also the time of the year where, unfortunately, Dacre and Stienborg feature on the menus of the animals that Byron's looking for. So leopards, leopards love uh, to catch Dacre and Stienborg. And you can imagine for someone or for leopards like Shongile and Hosanna and even Tumba to an extent, they'd probably be a little bit on the easier side to try and catch those antelope. My goodness, I'm feeling slightly parched. I'm going to have to have... Uh, something to drink. I'm going to have to have some water to quench my thirst now. And I keep, that sounds like I've got a, well, it feels like I've got a frog or something stuck in my throat. But without further ado, can you believe it? Byron has magically pulled a leopard out of his sleeve. Oh, yeah, we found him, everyone. We found him, we found him, we found him. Oh, yeah. He did we move him, down the opposite direction. There he goes. There he goes. We'll get a view of him. He looked as if he was stalking something. There he goes, he's just moving through the 
bush at the moment. As I said, the temperature cooling down, chances of finding him are a bit better. And here he is, right here next to us. I'm not sure what he saw. It may have been a, a little Daker or a Steenbok. There he is. Unfollow my audio. Just gonna move a little bit. No, it's fine. We'll, we'll sit tight here. We'll sit tight. Oh, and, well, this has made my afternoon. Thankfully, it was Craig that spotted him too. Saw his head sticking out in front of us. We came back down the same road again. You see the persistence driving around a few more times just paid off and luckily we got to find him and just in time because now he's moving even further away from the dam. Just gonna move off the road slightly and there's a car behind us so I just want to give them a, a view of this leopard too. We'll, we'll wait for him. He might, uh, he might decide to come out into the road. Let's just wait and see. There we go, there he is. He's approaching the road now. Isn't that a nice surprise? You see, once we found him, then he decides to walk out in the road. But before that, he was hiding in a thicket. Oh, that lovely view. Oh, what a nice surprise. Wasn't that great? So we'll try to follow him for a little while and see where he goes. You see, it, it appears as if he's, I don't know if he's hunting necessarily, but leopards are always very opportunistic. So they'll have a look around and if they flush anything, as we did while we were driving through that drainage line, we flushed a little stenbok. So this leopard would be looking for something like that, a stenbok or a diker, possibly impala if he does see any. Just try and move again. <laughs> and Paul, you say this is your favorite big cat. Oh, where did your favorite big cat go, Paul? Can you see him there? Oh, there he is, yeah. It's amazing how they can sometimes disappear and move around quite quickly. I once um, was following a leopard and uh, and it was a female, she was walking down the road and we thought we'll drive around and just wait for her basically on the corner and try to get a nice view of her walking down the road. and. Um, she, we'd lost a view of her for a split second and she disappeared. We couldn't find her again. She disappeared into the long grass. It was incredible. Really amazing to see. I guess that's why these animals are so elusive. But when you do see them, it is really such a lovely surprise. can hear some uh, rattling cesticulars alarm calling at the leopard while he's walking. Now we might see what they often do, I can still see him there just moving through there. What they, what they often do is when these birds alarm call at them, the leopards occasionally lift their tails up. Now he's not quite doing it at the moment. The reason for that is there's a very clear white marking under the tail. So when these birds alarm call at the leopards when they're walking through the bush, they lift the tail up 
to make themselves more visible. And the reason for that, well, the theory behind it is that they're showing that they're not a threat, they're no, no danger, they're just passing through. So they're lifting their tails up, making themselves more visible to hopefully stop those birds from alarm calling at them. Because what happens is then they, get, they draw a lot of attention to them, which they don't want. But it is interesting, you'll often see it with leopards walking and they, um, they lift their tails immediately. There he comes. Not sure if he's seen anything again. Tam, you say leopards are so mysterious. Yes, mysterious, um, elusive. They really are, really are wonderful, wonderful animals. And you see how he's constantly scanning and checking the area. And Jesse, you asked, have I ever been frightened by a leopard? Um, I told a story the other day, actually, we were tracking a big male leopard uh, down in the south on Londolozi. And uh, this leopard, <laughs> we walked around the car for about five minutes. We couldn't see where the tracks went. And as we took two steps off the road, he basically burst out of the bushes in front of us. He was lying there the whole time hiding. And um, and as soon as we took st uh, steps towards him, he then uh, gave a growl. But like, he didn't actually charge us. He just ran out and around to the back of the bush again. Um, but we got both myself and my tracker that I worked with, uh, Judas, my friend. He, um, him and I both got a fright. The guests laughed at us. They thought it was quite funny. <laughs> so I've been, I've got one or two frights from leopards before. I'll just see where he's going. It would be wonderful if we saw some impala up ahead. Or any small antelope could be could be quite interesting. But again, just look how well he blends in. As soon as he starts walking behind these trees, now you can see him quite nicely with um, because of Craig's great camera work. But for us. Sitting here, it's actually quite difficult. Once he goes through that long grass, he disappears. Oh, did he see something there? Did he seem to just run? He just had a little, little dart at something, but he stopped again. <laughs> it could also be a little mongoose. Or, oh, what's he seen? What's he seen? Hold on. I don't want to lose him. Uh, Craig, I'm going to try to squeeze through here quickly. There he goes, there he goes, still got him straight ahead. I'm just gonna park here, let's just see. He's straight ahead of us, but let's just see and scan if he has spotted something up ahead. The way he, but the way he darted off, he, he, like I said, it could have been mongoose, it could have been Franklin's, um, although the Franklin's probably would have made a noise. Bobby, interesting question. You asked if the leopard's fur is smooth or coarse. Now, Bobby, I've never felt a leopard's fur, um, but I believe that the leopard's fur is actually very soft, very smooth, very soft. Now, the other big cats, lion and cheetah, are very coarse. Their hair is very coarse. I've felt cheetah before. And um, I'm just gonna stop here again. So I'm giving him a bit of space. I don't want to disturb him too much. Um, so we're quite we're quite far from him now, but he's still just ahead of us. Also, I'm driving off road so that I don't lose view of him. I'm just checking out in front of him to see 
if there is anything but look look how well he disappears in that in that grass look at that isn't that camouflage in, uh, incredible so Bobby yeah um, so I believe that the leopard's fur is quite soft Uh, he's probably going to come out on that road again, um, and maybe that's why I stopped to look around, just to see if he if he does expose himself out into the open. That nothing is there to potentially see him. <laughs> well, while we <laughs> while we wait for Hassan to expose himself. Let's go to James and hopefully he doesn't expose himself, but he's in the Mara. <laughs> Let's see what my old friend James Henry is up to. <laughs> Mara, you can see the pinkening of the sky there. You can see the golden bellies of some very fat lions indeed. And uh, well, shortly we'll show you some vultures. My name is James Henry. And it's very nice to be back out in the field with you. Hello, Fergus. Hello. Fergus is on camera. He is, and we're going to be out here probably, well, certainly into the darkness. I don't know exactly how many segments we're going to do from here, but our plan is to basically find three things. This is the sort of general directive. The one is lions, the second is wildebeest, and the third is signal. With those three things, we're fairly guaranteed, we hope, of some action. Well, we've got lions, there they are. And then well beyond them, by about, say, ooh, 300 meters, you can perhaps see a line of what probably look like little black ants. Those are the wildebeest, but I'm not sure that we have a great deal of signal where those wildebeest are, so I'm not sure. And zebra, look at that. But you can see that the migration herds have now come up well north of where they have been before this year. There are many to the north of us, and even with our very favoured Angama pride, they are now starting to come into their territory. We saw a small group there, and if this bunch don't look like they're going to get up and do anything, which I'm seriously doubting they will, because uh, they've certainly killed the wildebeest just down the road and then left it. I think that we will probably head back to the Angama Pride Territory as darkness falls and see what happens over there. Remember, you can talk to us, hashtag Safari Live. We're just as live as Taylor in the tent and Byron in the bush. You see how I did that there, that focus? Mm -hmm. mm, very nice. And you can ask us anything you like, send us any questions or comments. We've had a very pleasant weekend here. We obviously did our TV show on Friday, on Saturday morning, and then this morning I came out here, found these lions, and well, they don't seem to have moved more than three inches. They very nearly killed a zebra this morning. He, a young foal that had been separated from the herd somehow, pretty much walked up to what, uh, almost, about 30 feet beyond the second tree trunk that you can see there and these lions could not have been more than 40 feet from it and they just sort of carelessly had a bit of a run but they didn't make any real attempt at cunning or stalking or anything else like that and so unsurprisingly they missed they were unsuccessful and they've just had to digest the five or six meals they probably ate last night so it is boon time or boom time here up in the Northern Triangle. The weather today was, well, looks like a storm coming in over the Olololo escarpment, which is a little bit disturbing given the amount of time that we're going to be out here. And Ubombo girl, you say that they are fat, flat cats. They could not be better described. They are certainly fat, they are certainly flat, and uh, well, yes, they're certainly cats, aren't they? So what I think we'll do from here is probably just reverse and try and get down into that migration herd. See if we have signal there. I don't think we're going to. And if we don't, then we'll come back here, see what they're going to do. And if they don't do anything in the next half an hour or so, we'll head back towards the Angama Pride. Just in the distance, I can hear the bang, 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 bang beautiful beautiful vultures and storks all over the place here such a good time for them of course 
and I believe that Byron is having a lovely time out in the bush. He's always wanted to be known by the moniker Little Chief, and so that is why he is following the Little Chief. We are indeed, James, and great to have you with us from the Mara. Hope you're having a lovely day up there. Um, and Osana has now gone and he's laid down a little bit. But again, just look at that camouflage. I mean, look how well he blends in with that grass. I honestly think if you were just scanning through here, you wouldn't see him at all with the naked eye. Look at that. Very difficult to spot. This is such a nice treat. And especially because he's moving around. Now this morning he lay lay down and those of you who were watching this morning, Sunrise Safari, he was on his back and, and almost fast asleep, resting paws up in the air. You know, at one stage he was resting his paw on the log. And he was lying next to. such a lovely afternoon. So I said it's still a cool temperature, there's a bit of a breeze, you can hear some birds calling in the distance, there's a few cape turtle doves. But the the um the leaves are rustling at the moment in the, the dry leaves are are rustling in the wind. Sinak, you asked if I've ever seen leopards. I'm just listening. Hold on a second. These birds are going wild. I wonder if it's because rattling cesticulars, all alarm calling, a huge group of them. I wonder if it's because of the leopard lying down there. I think so. So Sinak, you asked if I've ever seen a leopard lying in the long grass and jumping out and attacking its prey or, or um, ambushing its prey. I have seen leopards hunt and stalk and kill before. Not often, but uh, but I have indeed seen it. Yeah, are those, listen to those um, cesticulars calling, listen to that. Can you hear them? Oh, they're straight, straight behind him in that tree, um, in that little bush, so just up to the left. There we go, there they're all sitting, look at that. Rattling cesticulars. Down a little bit, Craig, there we go, just, there we go, there they're all at the bottom of that branch, all those trees. There you go. Now, the, um, the rattling cesticular has been called the black mamba of the bird world. And the reason for that is the inside of the rattling cesticular's mouth is pitch black and you might be able to see it a little bit with that one chirping at the bottom left. Here we go. Do you see that bright black mouth inside, inside? And, um, and I have heard of them being referred to as the black mamba because of that. The black mamba snake obviously has that pitch black. Oh, there's a shagra. Shagra just joined. Looks like a brown crowned shagra. That one with the white brow over there. So it's come to investigate. Why are these birds alarm calling? It's want to, uh, wanted to have a look. That's one of my favorite little birds, those shagras. But those rattling cesticulars do not give up. Tenacious little birds, constantly alarm calling if there's any sign of a predator. There's a few of them there. So as I was saying, that black mamba got, has that pitch black mouth. That's where it gets its name from, not because of the color. The snake itself is actually gray in color, but it's that pitch black mouth when it, or when it opens its mouth if it feels threatened. And the same with that rattling cesticular. I 
Sinek, uh, you asked what other species of cysticula do we have in this area? Um, oh, I'm just trying to think the, the red face cysticula. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think they. Um, I think they're on the like edges of of little rivers and that and that that's red faced cysticula. We have um, zitting cysticula. We get in this area too. Um, uh, what else do we get? Let me just have a look here quickly. So we've got the rattling, the um, the zitting cysticula. Uh, I'm trying to think that well, don't we get the the lazy cysticula also occurs in this area I haven't seen one of those um, those are those are the only ones that I can think of rattling red-faced lazy uh, and the uh, zitting cysticula I don't think we get Wing snapping cysticula. I've never seen one of those though, but uh, it says they occur in the area. Um, the whaling cysticula. I'm trying to think of the whaling. Yeah, the whaling occurs in this area a little bit too. Never seen that. Let's check the tinkling. So the tinkling cysticula we don't get yet. There are a number of cysticulas. There's in Southern Africa. We've got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. 16, 18, 18 cysticulas that we have in this area, uh, well in, in southern Africa, but quite a, a few species that we see, some I haven't seen yet. Um, Alright, well I'm going to see, maybe I'm, I'm going to try reposition, let's head back to Taylor in the tent and she wants to talk about lions apparently. I did! But look who I found walking around outside. It's Herbie. <laughs> Remember Herbie? I feel like you guys haven't seen him for such a long time now. But it's great to have you back. Welcome. How was your holiday? Yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. What did you get up to, Herbie? Um, to, to improve my trekking skills. I was, you, really? Yeah. Did you did do it? an assessment? Yes, I did. What, type, what level did you manage to get? Um, level three. Oh. He says that so casually. Let me just quickly explain to you exactly about the tracking assessment. So we do these track and sign assessments, obviously to constantly keep uh, improving ourselves. Now you get you get level one, which is oh I can't remember the percentage now, but it's the, it's the basic level. Then you get level two, pretty competent tracker. Level three, you're unbelievable. And then if you get a hundred percent, you normally get invited uh, to a special event uh, and have the opportunity to meet some of the master trackers in the country. So well done, level three. That's very impressive, don't you think? I'm so proud of you. You didn't tell me. This is the first time I'm hearing about it too. So that's fantastic. So now, as you all know, Herbie has always got tricks up his sleeve. I miss going on bushwalks, but we hope we're going to be doing the bushwalks too. What is on the ground? Look what's on the floor. Hashtag <laughs> safari. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Hashtag, please can we have to have it up. Hashtag, and then we, missing the safari part. Maybe the car key will be the safari. And then the live. Isn't that honestly just one of the most amazing things you've ever seen? Oh, that is the greatest thing. Herbie? Oh, uh, you want it this way? Okay. Where they were saying it was the uh, other way around. Let's try again. Maybe we can try, someone can add safari in there. Yes, there we go. Why don't you take some screenshots and you can help us out. You can use in your most creative font. You can add the safari. I've even left a gap for you. And that would be great. And you can hashtag actual safari live on Twitter so we can all see it. I think I need a new profile picture. This would be fantastic. Herbie, how long did it take you to make this? This is great. That's good. I'm going to put this in my room. Can I have it? Please. Yeah, for sure. I'm just taking it. <laughs> I'm going to keep this for the rest of my life. You know that. I'm going to put it up on my wall in my bedroom. That is fantastic. Now, um, so yeah, how, how long did it uh, take you to make that? Um, I'll say almost the whole day. Almost the whole day. 
was very, very, uh, very fantastic of you, Herbie, for, for doing that. I'm so impressed. I could never do anything like that. I'm abso absolutely hopeless. So, Herbie, I have a question for you. What are you most excited about seeing when we go on our bushwalks? Um, leopards. Leopards. You excited to track them? Yes. And well, those are my favorites. Your favorites. Yes. What about finding lions? Because we've had a problem with trying to find the lions. They they are too quick for us every time. We think we on the target and we're on the tracks just a few steps behind. We never get them. We need you. Um, yeah, I also like trekking or finding lions, but at the very same time, with our trekking and chances being restricted here because of of these lions crossing to our neighboring property, it's. We are just playing a, a, a dirty game, I'll put it that way. So. <laughs> See, even Herbie agrees. <laughs> they are so sneaky at the moment. But why do you think it is that the lions are not staying on the property anymore? Um, I know for sure that our lions here are buffalo specialists. And at the moment, we are struggling in finding buffaloes in the property. So there will be more in the areas that we know. Um, buffaloes are always in that, those particular areas. Oh. Which is, like for now... It's to our south and also to our north. Fair enough. That's exactly it. So what I want to do now is um, I said to you earlier that we were going to get some clips and put together to have a look at what the lions were doing last year. And as Herbie said, the Nguhuma Pride are lion specialists. So, Chantal, if it's possible, can we play clip number two and have a look and see what those lions actually got up to? This amazing action that we've just come across. The lions have managed to bring catch a buffalo that they chased I'm going through the thicket. Now it's a young calf. Come on, lions, you can take this down. Isn't this amazing? Come on, it's a little calf. The rest of the herd of buffalo have raced away. Unfortunately, I think this is the end. Look at this. I think, unfortunately, that this is indeed the end for this buffalo calf. You can see the male now going in grabbing it by the throat. It needs to keep the calf quiet. Otherwise, the herd of buffalo are going to come back and try and chase these lions off. Well done, lions. Well, well done. Oh, you can see he is not letting anybody go to that carcass, which is going to be a bit of a problem because the females may gang up on him in order to get a good feed. The buffalo actually try to get up again. I can't believe it, that it managed to gain that strength, perhaps with all the adrenaline that's also rushing through its body. And then, of course, everybody came through again, and the males grabbed straight hold of the throat to try and close that jugular. Now, the lions haven't seemed to be doing too much more damage to this buffalo just yet, but we've got another lioness who's joined in and is starting to feel... Now, that, in my opinion, was the best lion versus buffalo sighting I've ever had. And I've been very privileged to have some of those sightings. Actually, my best ones have actually been here while I've been at Wild Earth. I've been very, very lucky. How amazing was that, hey, Herbie? Yeah, that was cool. Really good. And, and again, that's what Herbie said. The, li uh, the lions here are buffalo specialists. So that's what they did pretty much every single day last year for as soon as I started working here, we would go out, we would try and remember where we saw the buffalo from the day before, and we were almost guaranteed, not quite 100% guaranteed, but we'd go in and we'd find these lines, and they either were taking down a buffalo when we got there, or they were stalking, or they were, or they were already feeding on it. And, and that's sort of not the only clip. There's so many of them there, but unfortunately, until those buffalo come back, and if they're just following the reins, just as the animals in Kenya are doing, going to the best areas where the best grazing is, that's where the buffalo are at the moment. And unfortunately, because of the late rains, they haven't quite returned yet. Whether they will return before the next rains, I'm not so sure. I really hope that they do, because I'd quite like to see our pride of lions again. I'd like to see how they grow, especially now with those six very healthy cubs. 
That's going to be quite interesting because they're getting to the age now where they should start hunting, aren't they, Herbie? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, we, we also had another sighting. I'll just quickly mention this one. It was really amazing where I was fortunate. It was on Halloween last year. You should remember that drive where I painted uh, different faces, different animals on my face with eyeliner. It was quite interesting. And we got to experience the young Uncle Huma cubs. They were only about, I think it was like five, six, and seven months old, the, the three different litters. And they actually took down a young calf of that size. Obviously, it was the lionesses that first took it down that actually uh, killed the mother earlier that morning, and the calf was hanging around the dam. So they took that opportunity and also took it down. And then the lionesses sat back once they'd weakened the calf enough, and the little ones went in and they jumped on their backs. They were practicing sort of all these maneuvers that they see the adults doing. And for lions at such a young age, to me, it just goes, wow. How how is that going to affect their experience in hunting buffalo in the future? And that's why I can't wait to get back and start following them and watching these little ones really learn. Because now their jaws are powerful. They're still small, but they could definitely do some damage and actually participate uh, once the buffalo is down on the ground on increasing the blood flow. You've seen how lions also bite on the spine to try and make the animal weaker to let it bleed out. They'll definitely be able to contribute. So, Herbie, have you got a favorite lion versus buffalo sighting that you've had since you've been working for Wild Earth? Yes, that was uh, to the east of uh, Vratella Dam. The very same pride in Kuhumas were following a big herd of buffaloes. Um, one of the lionesses went for the fully grown um, bull, but he, he went on, she went on top of, of him, but the rest of the buffaloes, they came back to help the, um, the attacked one. So eventually, they managed to chase off the lioness. Wow, so it wasn't a case of lions having their next meal, but the tables turned, and the buffalo managed to chase the lions away. Now, in that clip that you watched just a moment ago, uh, a, a similar thing actually happened. The whole herd came running back in to try and rescue, of course, uh, the young calf, but unfortunately, they just weren't quick enough, and the lionesses stood their ground and charged back and ended up sending the buffalo, running with their tails between their legs, and sadly, one less member. But there's many other cats on screen, as you know. Byron's with Hosanna. Let's go and see what the three of them are up to. Well, for the moment, Hosanna is resting. <laughs> That's what he's up to. And luckily, because it is cool, he's, still, he's lying out in the open, even though it's in the long grass. But he is out in the open. Um, I can see that beautiful golden light on him now. Uh, Jennifer, yours is her son an average size for his age? Yeah, yeah, that's, I suppose that is average size for a male leopard that age. Um, slightly bigger than a female. Um, well, I say slightly bigger than a female, slightly bigger than full full grown female. Males get much bigger; they get about twice the size of a female leopard. Um, so yeah, he is. I would say his average size. Roshni, you asked when will young leopards leave their, their homeland to find their own territory. So, Roshni, um, I suppose you mean the area or the area that their, their mothers um, raise them in. So, with with generally with young leopards, so what happens is, firstly, females can give birth to anywhere between one and three cubs with with leopards, and. With the female, what happens is if she has um, a female cub, for example, she will give up a portion of her territory for that young female, um, and that female will then have to extend that territory at some point by herself. Um, with the young males, they generally get pushed out. Uh, 
by the um, by either the the female or the the males in the area or the dominant male in the area he'll get pushed out and he will be nomadic until he gets to the age of about four five years old then he'll probably start trying to s set up a territory for himself uh, but Rashni, you must remember that the leopards become independent at about a year and a half so it's still quite some time before they actually become dominant and set up a territory for themselves with the females might be a bit young, younger I've seen females at the age of three mating and giving birth to um, two cubs um, three to four years old and uh, and then with with the males it's generally a bit older so about so about uh, four four or five years old before they start setting up territory for themselves I've seen a four-year-old going on five-year-old leopard challenge a big male leopard for territory and he came off second best he, he didn't uh, he was uh, quite a I suppose you could say he was a fighter he went and looked for trouble all the time and um, and did get into a lot of altercations with bigger dominant leopards trying to challenge for for their territory um, this was down in the south but yeah from about four years old he was looking to to set up territory for himself but uh, I think young Osana probably gonna hang around for a little while longer before he decides that he needs to try set up a territory he'll be fine for now but when he does start scent marking or trying to become territorial I'm assuming his father Tingana won't tolerate that and will probably push him out then at that age but at this age, he will still be tolerated because he is a young leopard and he's no threat. Riti leopards are just solitary animals. They, um, they move around by themselves. The only time you'll see leopards together is if it's a mating pair of leopards, so a male and female, or otherwise if a female has got cubs and she's looking after those cubs generally they are solitary and it's just the niche that they they fill in nature uh, as a predator so you don't have groups of leopards or a group of leopard is known as a leap of leopards but uh, you don't find them in groups uh, only uh, only um, a male and female if they're mating otherwise young cubs with the mother I have seen, I've seen um, leopards interacting, more than one leopard interacting. I've seen males, uh, a male mating with two females at the same time. Um, and I've seen two males trying to mate with one female. Now that is unusual, very unusual, but it can happen. All right, well, let's head back to Tenting Taylor and see what tantalizing titbits she has for us in the tent. <laughs> now, I was going to say that James was the king earlier of alliteration. Scrap that. Byron is now the king of alliteration. That was fantastic. I remember I, I made an attempt once where I was trying to say saucy safari and I don't know, oh, and it was just an absolute disaster. So two thumbs up for you, Byron. Right, now seeing as though we've been talking about the drought and lions and where are they, when will they come back, that type of thing, maybe we should focus on the prey, being the buffalo. Hang on. <laughs> and Essentia's just lost her headphones. I'm just hooking them back on. <laughs> I thought I saw that, and I thought if it was me, um, luckily it wasn't me that didn't that had headphones because I would have dragged monitors, and the skulls would have fallen down, and the whole tent would have collapsed. I just create that much drama. Now I've placed this buffalo on the table over here, and one thing that's very typical with buffalo sk uh, skulls out in the bush is that it's hard to find a completely intact skull. You always notice that, unfortunately, the nose ends up getting sort of well for lack of better words, chewed off. I apologize. I cannot sort of uh, muster up the strength to come up with anything better than that. And that is purely because when the lions have attacked their prey, they've now pushed the buffalo down to the ground. One lion will always go to the snout and try and suffocate it. 
like that. So if my hands are, well, the jaw of a lion, we don't have the lion skull anymore, I'm afraid, otherwise I would have used the skulls um, and demonstrated with them. And it will bite over like this, closing down all the skin onto the nasal cavity and pressing those nostrils flat and then also clamping the jaw shut in the same breath so that it can't open its mouth and breathe. It's a very slow process. The other thing is, is that they will go through, uh, go for the throat too and they'll try and crush the windpipe. Um, that's another technique. That normally they do a combination of things. It's not always just one way. They'll have some lines on the back like I was describing earlier. Uh, they will be biting on the spine trying to uh, get the blood to flow, get, to, get it to weaken the buffalo. But it's really amazing. Now have a look at this one. Completely gone. I reckon what's happened here as well, I don't think it was just lions that were feeding on this buffalo. I think the hyenas came in afterwards and had a go at it too. And as you know, hyenas have got very, very powerful jaws, very strong teeth, and are one of the few animals that are able to digest large shards of bone due to their amazing digestive system and all the sort of bacteria and things. It's incredible. And I think that they were biting away at it. Now, there are also lots of things living in here. There's daddy long legs. I'm just trying to see if I can maybe find any any other spiders in here no it seems as though the daddy long legs are the ones that are living in this buffalo too right we can put this one back down on the ground my goodness i've done so much reading not quite just collecting so many skulls and well i need to put them back because if james does a surprise visit i'm going to be in so much trouble can you imagine he'll come in here with a stick probably something like a knob thorn stick and start beating away and all this type of thing so i better make sure that i keep it clean and tidy otherwise i'm going to find myself in a lot of trouble anyways speaking about james it's great to have him on the show today we've definitely missing him around here uh, no Never mind. <laughs> we will go to him at some point. It seems as though uh, we've lost communication with Kenya. So that's all right. It's okay, James. We'll get back to you just now then. But it'll be nice um, to go back to him eventually and have a look. Right, what else have we got here? Should we? No, we'll leave this here for a moment. I will at some point go outside as well and, uh, and start collecting some more items. And there is another lion clip that I want you to watch, which we'll also chat about. Uh, a little bit later, but it seems as though James is ready. Earpiece is in. He's hearing final control all the way in the Sabi sand, so let's go to him. Thinking. Hello, everybody. Sorry, we just uh, got a few issues with our communications, but I think we are live. Good. We got in amongst the herd, not around where those lions were, we gave up on them, they're too fat and flat, and so we got in amongst this herd that is all around us now, and we're hoping that we might find some lions. We've now got the other two things that we need, signal and wildebeest. Now we need signal, wildebeest and predators, and then we will have the trifecta. Anyway, I'll ask Ferg to sort of pan around and show you what's going on here. There we go. You can see lots of wildebeest all over the place, vultures by the dozen. And they're still flying around, even at this time of the day when it's pretty chilly, not very warm at all anymore, and yet they are still flying around. And I think that they follow these herds because A, they know that the stuff is going to get killed. They also know that a lot of these animals drop dead of their own sort of, well, not of their own volition, but certainly by causes other than crocodiles and vicious uh, lions and cheetah and that sort of thing and so they pick up the scraps as they go and I think that for the vultures this is a real boom time they seem to be using that term quite a lot this afternoon well certainly twice anyway so the other thing that I'm listening to here or listening for as you look at a marabou stalk and another vulture is whether or not we can hear any wildebeest alarm calling or see any that are showing signs of some sort of distress. The ones around here, of course, are, well, pretty much relaxed because you cannot, you cannot track here, of course. You can't get out of the car. The grass is so thick that you can't see where lions walked. And so you really have to kind of use various other methods of lion detection. And one of those, of course, as we use it everywhere, is the alarm calling of animals. And you can hear them doing their gnu gnus.
Hello, Riti. You want to know how many prides of lions there are in the Mara? Uh, we don't know, Riti. It's uh, enormous. It's of 1,510 square kilometers. That's some 150,000 hectares. I'll go through the prides that we know of. We know of the Olololo Pride, we know the Angama Pride, we know the Mugoro Pride, we know the Paradise Plains Pride, we know the Serena North Pride, which could indeed be the same thing as the Paradise Pri Plains Pride. We have got the uh, Egyptian Goose Pride, the Sausage Pride, the Border Pride, and that's just on the Mara Triangle, which is one third of the Masai Mara. Over the other side of the river, we've met the Salas Pride, we've met the Black Rock pride we've met the runkai pride we have met the hey who who else have we met uh, i feel like there's more, there are one or two more that we have met anyway you can tell from what i've said there that there are a great deal of lion or a great number of lion prides in this area and I think you're going to find that as this migration moves towards the north the boundaries between those pride territories are going to become more blurred and I think also you'll have quite a lot in the way of uh, nomadic animals coming into and out of this area sort of sneaking a meal here and there so nomadic males who don't yet have territories and that sort of thing Righty, shall we try and drive a little bit? Let's see if we can maintain signal and we'll try and drive along a little bit. Ooh, Walcha. I got ooh, copy, snazzy. Ah, there we go. Ah, snazzy, you've got a question. You say, what are these trees called? These are mainly two kinds of trees. One, a Balanites aegyptica, and the other, a shepherd's tree. And I've just bought a trees of the East African uh, savannah, and so I will find out more about those trees in due course. But those are the main ones, and they're not uh, the flat-topped acacias that people think of when they come to an area like this. And I'm not—I guess those impressions come from the Serengeti rather than the Masai Mara up here. We'll try and get a bit closer to some of the vultures. I think that the Rupel's griffin vulture which is a very close relative of the white-backed. I think he's a rather beautiful fellow. And then we'll see if we can't get to one. Lots of leopard-faced vultures here as well, of course, which are the biggest ones. And in fact, if we look off to the left there, uh, just park nice and level. No, try and park nice and levelish. There we go. You can see trees full of vultures all over the place. And those ones with the mottled backs are the Rupal's griffins. There we go. You can see the light starting to fade slowly. It's not very late yet, but there's quite a lot of cloud in the west, which means that the sunset in the western sun that would be hitting us normally is uh, well gone behind the clouds. There we are. And then just down below that fir, oh, it's gone now. There was a hitchhiker on one of these wildebeest and it was of course not a, an oxpecker but a wattled starling Let's see if i can't find another one of those now normally the wattled starlings where i'm from uh, will fly around the feet and pick up the invertebrates rather than actually hitchhike Deborah, you want to know when most of the Mara vultures uh, nest? I, I don't know. I, I guess I can find out for you straight away, if you like. Let's find out here. On my, I'll check my app first, and if I don't succeed there, I've got a very nice book as well. Uh, a vulture. Let's go with, well, let's go with my favourite, which is the Rupal's Griffin. See what it says. No, it actually just describes describes what it looks like, which of course is rather obvious because I'm looking at it. Ah, they nest in cliff and rocky outcrops, much like the that's interesting. Much like the cape vultures. Oh, look at the rain. That is distressing. Where are you pointing the camera? Oh, just exactly where we were thinking about going. Well, we're not going to go over there now. Let me just have another quick look. Look here at my other book and see if I can't get a satisfactory answer for what time of the year they breed. Here we go. 
That's it. Birds of the Maasai Mara. Let me see if I can't find something on the vultures. It is a very sort of ominous feeling evening, this one. On account of the rain and the cloud, we had a beautiful day without any kind of cloud at all. And then, fairly typically, as the uh, as the afternoon started to started to fall, so the clouds began to build. Right, page number forty, I believe, is where I need to be looking. There we are. No, this is mainly just an identification guide, I'm afraid. So I can't tell you when they breed, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Oh, here we go. Breeds in low densities, usually nesting atop an acacia or desert palm tree. Well, it doesn't say when. I suspect they're fairly aseasonal, you know. There's always a fair amount to eat here. Despite the fact that obviously the migration is not always in town. I think this is more kind of a bonus time than it is uh, something that everyone depends on for their staple, you know. And that goes for all the predators as well. There's plenty to eat here all the time. And it's, this is just a kind of bonus time of the year. Aaron, you're wondering about the rarest vulture species we can see in the Var Mara. I suspect quite strongly uh, that it is the... Uh, I think you can get... Can you get cape vultures up here? You might be able to. If, you, if not the cape vulture, the white-headed. But again, I'm going to check that up for you quickly. Let's just have a look-see. Well, I mean, you can get a palm nut vulture here in theory. But that would be... So that would be very rare indeed. But uh, I haven't yet to see one here. Egyptian vulture, perhaps. Yeah, you can get Egyptian vulture. That would be very unusual. And, no, you don't find cape vultures here, which is quite interesting. You do get white-headed. They are pretty rare. Although, I mean, their distribution would indicate that they're not particularly rare. But I think you will find them. You'll find them pretty rare. So those would be my answers. Somewhere between the white-headed, the Egyptian, and the palm nut. You'd, well, I mean, if you saw palm nut here, it would be pretty far out of its distribution, but it is possible, and I'm sure they have been seen here. All right, we have, we're with the flattest cats in the Masai Mara, just to some lions a little while ago, and now we are going to carry on, but Byron would like to tell you more about his spotted flat cat. <laughs> well, our spotted um, cat is laying down. Oh, I don't know why, I don't know why, but I must be honest, I, I can't, I, I, don't in I don't like the term flat cat. <laughs> don't judge me, everyone, but I I just I really don't like it. Now I think the other vehicles moved off, so that's a good sign. Hassan is going to stand up now and he's going to walk around for us. <laughs> that's my wishful thinking kicking in there. You know what? Patience, as I said, I've said many times, patience pays off. It's getting a bit chillier now. So we're gonna sit. We're gonna sit with him because it's just so nice to be able to sit with a leopard like this. And he's rolling around. He lifts his head now and then. And as I said, it's starting to cool down. So chances are he might decide to get up and move around some more. That's what I'm hoping for. So now, because these other vehicles have left, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to miss out on anything. I'm so I'm always so scared that if I say if I say oh you know what he's going to rest and sleep here and then uh, and he won't do anything and we move and next thing he'll get up and it's Murphy's law he'll get up and start moving and who knows what he'll do or what he'll get up to. <laughs> so. Riti, you were asking if leopards can die from being malnourished. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, if they don't get the food that they need, 
Um, if they're hungry, they're unable to hunt, they're not strong enough, then uh, then definitely, then definitely be able, or definitely um, um, die from, from lack of food or malnourishment. Amazing. Okay. Just pointing out the leopard to one of the other guides. Oh, Riti, you asked how do leopards groom their coat? Well, Riti, they, like any of the big cats, they'll just clean and lick themselves. Now, the big cats like leopard and lion have got um, they've got barb-like hairs on their on their tongue. They've got very very rough tongues. So by licking and cleaning themselves, they actually get um, they actually get a lot of the ticks and fleas off of them. He's lifting his head now and then. I don't know if he's gonna. Let's watch him. Come on. Um, but they do so just by licking. They'll clean themselves and groom themselves very, very well. Very thick tongues, just like a um, just like a lion. A lion's got an incredibly rough, rough tongue. And so do the leopards with these little hairs on the tongue, little barbs almost that uh, make it very, very rough. And you'll you'll see it. The, 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 Probably the best example is when you see these cats feeding on something, they'll often lick the carcass, they'll lick and clean some of the skin off, and they use their, obviously they use their tongues, but you can hear, and you can see them actually pull the carcass with their tongue, just by licking it, especially the lions. You'll see a few licks, and they'll, they'll clean an entire patch of hair off the carcass, and then they'll start feeding. So I'm I'm not going to give another alliteration for the tent, but let's head back to Taylor. She's got a few carcasses or and skulls that she'd like to show you. I definitely have a carcass. Now I'm just trying to I don't know if it's actually going to work uh, because the wind is now picked up and it's just blowing everything around. Um, what can I use? I need to play what can we use to shelter what I want to do from the wind. I'm sure bones would work. Let's use that. I need to try and just get a bit of protection over here. Is that going to work? Because it's a spider carcass that I want, not a carcass, exoskeleton that I want to show you. Hmm. You know what I'm going to have to do? We'll do that in the next segment. I'll have to play around and uh, unfortunately get it into a container of some sort, quite a deep one. I think that will probably protect it from the wind because it's not going to work now. And I also need to then uh, take away the old web. But I won't tell you which spider it is just yet. Anyways, we have another clip uh, which was quite interesting of uh, lions, buffalo and elephant. Are you ready to watch it? because I am. So I think, let's have a look at that one. I think it's clip number one. Okay, everyone, something has just materialized over here. These lionesses have spotted some buffalo moving. Not too far away, you but look at that. Oh, that buffalo is getting much closer. Uh, I think the buffalo, oh, there we go. Elephant or trumpeting? There we go. Oh wow! Look at this. Yes, <laughs> this is incredible, everyone. Just again, everybody, for those sensitive viewers, um, if you are watching, it's not always easy to see, but this is nature, everybody. So just um, just bear that in mind, please. And. There's some elephant coming into the, the area now too. Let's see what happens. Wow, this is... Oh. Look at that. Managed to shake off that lioness and get away. Now with this elephant just off to the right, you might see it coming into frame. There we go. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you see the lionesses moving off very quickly. Look at that, isn't that incredible? Buffalo managed to get away and the elephants chased the lions off. You see, lions do not really like big elephant. I'm just gonna watch what this elephant does. No, 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 easy, easy, easy. I'm not going to move, she's just chasing that other lioness. Don't charge us. Hey, 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 don't worry. See, I don't want to move. No, hang on. Mm -mm. We're not here to hurt you. See, I don't want to make too many loud noises and sounds like this other guy is doing. Um, see, they're a little bit upset with these lions around. This is just a young elephant there. Welcome back, everybody. You're now live with us. That clip that you did uh, just see, that Byron uh, had the privilege of sitting in that sighting. I think it was last year, actually. I remember I was, I was still working at that time. I don't know what I had. I don't think I'd had something as exciting as that. But uh, that was just a catch-up clip. You're back with us. Remember, hashtag Safari Live with all of your questions. This is happening right now. Now, that is an amazing sighting to have. And I reckon within a space of a couple of months, Byron first headed off when he had that incredible sighting. Then Jamie had a sighting where the lions were feasting upon a buffalo, which they'd killed, I think it was the night before. And a group of elephants came in and chased them off of the carcass. They then, the elephant then investigated around the carcass. And then one evening, you might remember this too, we had a similar sighting. We'd sat with Nguhuma Pride the whole day. And the little ones were climbing up on the marula trees. It was so great. It was when the cubs were still quite young. And we sat off and they started stalking the lionesses. And I said to you, we're not going to follow them because we don't want to ruin the chances of the hunt. You always want to give the animal an opportunity. And then we heard the distress calls and David and I went racing down. And then unfortunately, the gremlins got us and we weren't able to continue. But the same thing happened, just as you saw there with Byron. Unfortunately, the buffalo that they caught died relatively quickly. It must have been extremely weakened from the drought. And you saw that from that clip. You could see a lot of ribs. You could start to see the spine and all the vertebrae. So it just shows you how these um, how these animals unfortunately suffered during the drought. The predators, however, seem to thrive until the white muscle disease came about. But that's we'll talk about that a little bit later. What I do want to focus on, of course, is that when something is being attacked by a predator, even if it's a fight amongst the same species, they make a lot of noise, they're in distress. Wasn't it incredible? How we always say about the animals are always speaking the same language. Now, as that young buffalo bull was distressing and saying, um, help, help, you know, probably calling other buffalo, the elephants heard that call and they came charging in and said, right, we're not putting up with this. And I don't know if you noticed right at the end that one of the lions is actually just hiding away in the bushes, just standing absolutely still. Now, it's not often that we see lions sort of performing the freeze technique, which was one of the three very basic strategies that animals will use to try and evade predation. And it was very, very interesting to observe something like that. Just sitting there waiting, elephant completely forgot where the lion was, was distracted by all the vehicles moving around. What a great sighting and handled so well uh, by Byron too. And I'm sure he probably still tells his story, or well, that particular sighting, to all his other guests that he's fortunate uh, of, of taking out on safari. Now, one thing that to me was pretty incredible was, did you see Amber Eyes? Did you see how she took charge? In that entire sighting, how she she uh, she got up, she made the first run at that buffalo, that young bull, and then pounced on its back and then held on for dear life. And it's very very important. That's very very risky and it's very dangerous uh, for a lioness to do that because if it was a fit, healthy buffalo bull, things could have gone wrong. He could have bucked her off, and she would have fallen to the ground. And well, let me tell you, that's the scary thing about buffalo is that they don't stop. They come back, and that's why we on walks are always so worried about them and that's what they do to lions they'll keep coming back and pe keep horning down into the ground with those very very sharp tips these buffalo skulls that we've got here let me bring this let me see if i can bring this one down or unfortunately uh oh, i'll just use this one it'll be easier we're quite old bulls 
And if you look over here, you'll see that the tips of the horns are not particularly sharp anymore. That's not going to do too much. I mean, it would be very sore to have a buffalo using all of its weight. Remember, they can weigh up to 800 kilograms, so almost a ton. Imagine all that pressure pushing down on you. It would still hurt, but when they're a young foot bull, it's not quite needle sharp, but uh, I'll tell you right now, it'll hook into your skin, it'll rip you, and if you're not careful, um, if a lion is not careful, obviously we don't. We try and not bo bother the buffalo too much, uh, they'll get themselves into a lot of trouble and actually end up killing, uh, being killed by the uh, buffalo. So why they're one of the most dangerous animals in Africa, the buffalo, a force not to be reckoned with. Let me put this back. Now we have a question from Bobby, and that is, should I sit down? I don't know what to do now. Up, down, up, down. Sorry, Bobby. If you're wondering, can the lions para uh, paralyze the buffalo by biting on the spinal cord? Most certainly, but they're not doing it for that. In fact, the reason why they are biting on the spine like that is uh, one of the main reasons. You'll see they just chew, chew, chew. Uh, it causes a lot of bleeding. And when an animal like that is under stress, it's obviously getting hot. It's using a lot of energy. And if you make it bleed, well, then it's going to weaken it quicker as well. You know what I think is going to happen? As I feel, like, yeah, <laughs> I'm on a very unlevel piece of ground there. And I thought, if I dare lean back in my chair, which you should be able to do, I'm going to topple over. And can you imagine how much trouble I'd be f in from James? I reckon he'd probably fly here in a hot balloon to come and sort me out from knocking his skull straight off. <laughs> be a disaster. Now, Aurelia, you're wondering if uh, herb, other herbivores will always help each other in a, in a case like that? No, not necessarily. And sometimes even buffalo go, hang on, we may be biting off a bit more than we can chew. We're going to stand back, and unfortunately, Bob, you're going to have to take one for the team type of thing. But where they will, uh, where they can, not where they will, where they can, they will come charging in and try and help. I've noticed, though, if anything... It's normally elephants that come to the aid of uh, various animals rescue. And I've actually had sightings, like I said, many different times where elephants charge in and try and chase lions away uh, when they're trying to bring down a buffalo. So I, I don't know if anyone else has had any other encounters. Maybe we can pass this question along to Byron and perhaps James too. Maybe they've had other experiences where different uh, prey species have come in to assist. I've actually only seen it with, with um, yeah. Buffalo, elephants, and lions. I can't say that I've seen any encounters. Of course, there's a, the famous encounter of uh, the Kruger sighting where it was buffalo versus crocodile versus lions versus buffalo again. And eventually that, that little calf got away. I mean, that's just an amazing sighting to have. The apex predator in Africa, which is the crocodile, not only does it go after every single animal species, it doesn't discriminate from herbivore to predator, they'll eat it, but they also consider us as humans as food. Them and the polar bears, got to watch out for them. Uh, so, so yes, imagine having a sighting like that, and that is a possibility to have something like that. And that's the joy of Kenya. You just never know what you're going to see and I, I, I think everybody is so excited about the Maasai Mara and the Mara Triangle and everything that goes on in it but we're going to go across now, not to the Mara we're going to head straight to well, just down the road actually, however if I shouted this link out, Byron might be able to hear me, he's still with Hosanna and I wonder if he's woken up from his catnap um, I have actually woken up Taylor um and we're still sitting with Hosanna, but uh, I dozed off for a little bit, but I am awake. <laughs> now, I know Taylor was meaning the, referring to the leopard. He's still, he's still resting and lying down, um, not interested in moving. I think we'll give it a few more minutes. We were very fortunate at least to get him moving around and following him for a short while before he decided to lie down. <laughs> Uh, nice for him. nice to spend time with the leopard like this. Now I've just been listening to the radio. It doesn't sound like there's too much else going on. There are a few vehicles and they've all just come into our sighting with the leopard. Um, but uh, it doesn't sound like there's too much else going on. But we'll drive around shortly I think. We've spent probably enough time with them. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe, who knows, he could get up fairly soon. Um, no, I know Taylor was showing you that wonderful 
a wonderful sighting of those lions with the with the buffalo and um, and it was an amazing sighting it was really interesting and then to see the elephant come in and help the buffalo and I've like Taylor says I've only seen um, buffalo or elephant come in to help other animals uh, usually it's more a case of they smell the predators they don't like the predators and they come and chase the predators exquisite bliss you were saying Hassan's camouflage is amazing it is indeed it blends in so well with that dry grass I do sometimes wonder though that these animals when we are around I wonder if it, if they don't even though they're not threatened by us and they are relaxed I wonder if it, they decide to lie down and rest like this when the vehicles are around and as soon as we leave them they, they then get up and start moving I think it does happen from time to time I think our presence does disturb them a little bit uh, to an extent Although saying that, I've viewed leopards hunting and with them not uh, worrying about the vehicles at all. But I think if generally if they're just moving around, if they go and they lie down, they probably do that because they don't want to be followed anymore. Perhaps. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, James, good question. Okay, you say, which commonly used um, f fact or commonly used uh, story about leopards do I find false? Um, I think I, I think the, the one, um, and, and this is actually a funny story. So I think the, the one is, is that leopards only move around at night and and are, are mainly nocturnal that is false i can guarantee you that is false um now a funny story a, a, a guest of mine a guest that i've been uh, taking on safari oh, since 2009 i think um and he is so passionate about leopards and would specifically uh, request to look for leopards and um he was at a, a dinner party last year sometime and um, and they were having a conversation about nature and and wildlife, and they, the the topic of leopards came up, and he spoke about the leopards, and and uh, this lady then said to him, oh, but you, you know you don't see leopards during the day at all, and he said, you you do, you you, you definitely do. They move around during the day too. No no no, that's an absolute lie. You do not see leopards during the day. He got quite upset. He eventually said, okay, well, I'm not going to argue with you anymore because him and I have been viewing leopards for years and seeing leopards move during the day many, many times. I mean, we saw Hasana walking around at um, half past three in the afternoon. So, yeah, half past three, quarter to four. So it just shows you. And I've seen leopards 10, 11 o'clock in the morning going off and hunting. They definitely do move around during the day. We just probably don't see them that much. So, James, I think that's one that I can say is is definitely not true. I'm trying to think of what else, what other, what other f facts or stories that people mentioned about leopards that uh, that are untrue based on what I've seen. I've been very fortunate. I've seen. Well, there's a little stretch. That's usually a good sign. Stretching. I don't know if he's, but stretching and yawning with most of the cats in general is a sign that they may potentially get up and start moving around. They could also just get up, move two meters, change position and lie down again. Barbara, you asked, is it possible to to judge or gauge how large a cat will be judging on its paw size. Um, Barbara, uh, oh, that's tough. Um, look, 
Barbara, I mean, we can we can judge obviously whether it's a lion or leopard track based on based on the paw size. So we can tell that it's either a f female leopard or a male leopard or a lioness or a male lion. Um, now, Barbara, in terms of the actual size, it's I don't think so. Um, not necessarily, but but I'm sure that's pretty accurate enough to be able to tell you whether it's a lioness or a male lion. You, you know that's that's pretty close however i've seen i mean i've seen some male lions with very small tracks now there's a coalition that we used to see um on londolozi for for many years the majinga lion and their tracks were actually quite small occasionally the trackers would look and they'd they'd almost second guess themselves if it was a, a lioness or a male lion but um but the uh, yeah, so some lions might have smaller tracks. Some leopards, male leopards, might have smaller tracks than others. Um, so, but I think in terms of judging, look whether it's a male or female, you should be able to get that right. So, Barbara, I think yeah, you can kind of have a guess at whether it's it's a large cat or a small cat. Um, in terms of actual size, probably not. I don't know. All right, well, to be honest, I think we have spent enough time with this male leopard. It's um, It's been a wonderful sighting and nice to spend time with him. And he seems quite relaxed, but I think we'll leave him. We'll give him his, his um, privacy and allow him to carry on with whatever he feels like doing. We'll drive around, We're starting to lose a bit of light now too. Maybe we have some luck with some owls. Uh, but let's head back to Taylor in the tent and we'll see you soon. <laughs> it's lovely. Some nice ice cold water, of course. Now I have managed to get my spider situation sorted. Ah. Uh, I believe that if I look like I'm moving in slow motion, in a sense, it's just going to change some camera settings. Am I making you seasick? No, not anymore. It's fixed. <laughs> right. So um, I actually had a, a serious argument with the with the spider and the web because it was a nightmare. It kept getting stuck to my fingers, and then it kept getting stuck to my knife, and then the stick. And then I'd think I'd have it right, and then the wind would blow it over, even though I put it in a container. Right, so can we please go to the microscope? How cool is that? Look at that. Beautiful, even in Essentia. In Essentia's words were, did you just say, ah, oh, sweet, eh? <laughs> Well, there we go. That's exactly what it is. I don't know how sweet a spider can be. I've never eaten one before. Should we try it? This is not an actual spider, though. It's uh, it's just the exoskeleton. And this is actually a sack spider. Now, I seem to talk about sack spiders quite often, mainly because they attack my brother all the time. And I've told you many stories, so I, I shan't bore you anymore with my brother versus sack spider uh, incidents. And Ben, who is only eight years old, you were actually wondering... Do we have any spiders? Well, it's like I said, it's not alive, Ben. So this used to be as part of a spider. It's its old skin. So it molted. Now, it's very important. Many different animals out here molt. We see lizards molting. We see snakes molting. We see lots of different insects molting. And then, of course, the arachnids, the spiders, do exactly the same thing. And if they don't molt, they can't grow any bigger. Um, I'm kind of glad, though, that... We don't molt as humans. Can you imagine? That would be terrible. Or a leopard molting. But there is actually a couple of things I really wanted to show you on the microscope, if that's okay, if we can go back there, just so that I can have a look, so I can just talk about a few things. There we go. So the reason how I know that it is a sack spider is very, very easy to, of course, notice if you look at its mandibles. Look at that, completely black. And that is typical of the variety of sack spiders that you get across the globe. And then, of course, they're normally that sort of creamish color. Now, it was quite interesting how a sack spider actually has to shed its skin. It's something 
um, that I, and to be honest, I, I don't really know too much about, so I apologize in advance. I'm going to try and explain uh, how they do malt, but I, I shall be doing more research to find the proper terms. Uh, so, so, yes, I actually have a bit of a phobia of spiders, but this one's okay. So what happens is, I'm going to try and get a stick in here now. No, I think if I try and get a stick in here, it's going to be an absolute disaster. So you can see that it's all hollow and it's just the, the outside of the, the skeleton now. Uh, when they prepare to malt, it's basically like they need to pop out of their own skin. You can imagine, this is um, a very dangerous state too because they can't properly defend themselves when they are molting. So they're, they're vulnerable to predation as well. Anyways, they increase uh, the, the hemolymph, so that's insect blood or spider blood. They don't have blood like you and I have. And um, by doing that, uh, they increase their sort of heart rate as well. And then they're able to burst out of that skin. And then in between the old exoskeleton and the new exoskeleton, it's quite interesting. There's something called molting fluid. I I'm not exactly sure what molting fluid consists of. That's something that I want to do, will dive into and do a whole lot more research about. But they secrete it. And that's to tr help create a gap between the old and the new exoskeleton. And I, I'm su I suppose it also um, helps with sort of trying to slip out of it a lot easier. And then I thought to myself, what happens to that molting fluid afterwards? Because I've read about the molting fluid before, so I quickly popped it into the interweb, and they said apparently the spider then reabsorbs it, which is quite interesting. But I just found that absolutely fascinating. But you can come back to me now. I thought you'd like to have a look at the sack spider. But remember, you don't actually want to touch this spider at all because they have a cytotoxin so if it does bite you it can cause necrosis of the skin luckily for us you're not probably not going to die from a sack spider bite unless you are completely careless and you just let it get infected then you'll get a secondary infection and that's often uh, what might end up causing you uh, to end up in hospital so so don't do that just keep those wounds nice and clean and it was also a very nice example of the web don't you think you can see why they were called sack spiders. It's a thin, flat web, unlike that small little spider we had in the grass uh, using lots of strands. That one was almost a sheet, and it actually made it in the corner of the tent, but it, well, it wasn't being used anymore, so I disposed of it. We had a look at it for education. Right, let's go back across to Byron. It seems as though he has left Hosanna. He said something about owls, and he's been hooting about them all day. Let's go see if he's managed to find one. Well, we'll try our best, Taylor. We did leave Asana. Um, he's still lying down, resting. Uh, so I'm sure he'll get active fairly soon, may or maybe later this evening. Start moving around. The temperature's definitely dropped. Wow, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a cold one tonight. Best I zip up my jacket. Where should we go, Craig? I'm trying to think. Oh, we were we were asked to check the genet hole or the genet tree or the tree with the genet in it. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try free will. Let's see if it's there. Hold on. Come on. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing. There's no genet in that hole unless it got clever and is hiding from us. Uh, I mean, it's possible that it changed trees, changed areas maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But No genet in there at the moment, unfortunately. I was really happy when I did find that genet, but looks like the genet is too clever for us. It's okay, we'll see what else we can find. I'm trying to think which way we should go. Wow, there's a lot of elephant tracks here. Now I wonder where these elephant headed. Looks like they possibly went south across our boundary. Maybe we still find them. Chatty chatty Meg, you wanted to see elephant. Um, and I hope you heard my explanation of the whale and hippo scenario and distant cousins, uh, the hippos and whales. Uh, that, I'd still find that bizarre. I can't believe it. Like I said, I think if we go that far back, everything is a distant cousin of some, some sort. 
and as I said, even even James and I would then be distant cousins. We should actually we should actually um, send him that uh, that comment and see what he th <laughs> how he feels about that. <laughs> I can just imagine James's comments. <laughs> yeah, he's probably, probably trying to throw himself under the Land Rover as we speak. <laughs> Sinek. <clears throat> You ask, what is a genet baby called? It's called a baby genet. Um, <laughs> I, don't know. I actually don't know, Sinek. If it, uh, you obviously mean, is it, a, is it a cub or a pup or something like that? Wow, these elephants are three. I can see they broke this branch. Which way did they go? Let's see if I can find them. Now, Sinek, um, genet, genet, I wonder. Uh, Oh, there's some dwarf mongoose up ahead. Let's see if we can see them. Hold on. And see, Nick, let me check. I've got a feeling it's a... I've got a feeling it's a genet pup. I've got a feeling it's a genet pup. Don't quote me. Let me first double check. Um, let me see. I'm not... I'm actually not sure. <laughs> um, let's see if these... Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I trust Google. Um, apparently, Google says it's called a kit. Uh, I've never heard of that term before. Oh, and Taylor said so too. Okay, I, I believe Taylor. I believe Taylor. So, let's just see what they say. Uh, reproduction, young or born. See this book again doesn't give me any information on that. So apparently it's called a kit. Now, why? Why would it be called a kit? It's not. It's not related to cats. Um, a, a kit. Anyway, that's the term it, that is used. Kit. K I T. So CNAC, That's what a young genet is called. A baby genet. A kit. Um, and you see, that's why I love this. Uh, you know, we're always, we're always learning something. Uh, I, I love and really enjoy Safari Live, and especially all the viewers that send in the information and that afterwards, if we, if we perhaps don't know, because it's funny. I, it doesn't matter how long you have been working in the bush, how long you have been guiding for, you will always find something that you've never seen before or that you don't know. We are constantly learning and that's what is so fascinating about this this job and why I love it so much and why I enjoy getting people out into Africa because there's always something new. It doesn't matter how many times you come, how many times you go on safari, you're always going to see something new and something different and we're going to learn together. And that's the beauty of nature, I think, and that's wonderful. So a kit is a young genet. Thank you, Taylor and Google. Where are these elephants? Oh, they've been, they've been quite naughty. They've been throwing branches around, their trees pushed over. And it looks like there was some wallowing and that going on. Have a look at this. These elephants went to town in the mud wallow. Um, now you can see, do you see how it's definitely been, uh, they've been splashing mud on themselves. You can see signs of their elephant tracks in there. You can see how the mud has been pushed aside. So they've been rolling, splashing themselves. And I can just see the big footprints. That's why I know it is definitely elephant, but um, only elephant would create that amount of or could we call it damage or that amount of mud to be thrown around no other animal would would wallow in, and and uh, and make that amount of mess oh it would have been great to see that maybe we can still find the elephant who knows i wonder where they would have gone
Alrighty then, well, we will try and see if we can uh, find the elephant. Let's head back to Taylor in the tent. Yes, I have not gone anywhere. I'm still tenting Taylor. I'm just remembering to put my multi-tool away because that's how they get lost. Or in my case, they get taken away from me at the airport. I've lost many of those that way. Now, we've got two different types of thorns here. I'm trying to not prick myself. Look at them. Isn't that cool? Very sharp. We'll just have a little look at them. I want to actually put them under the microscope to have... Uh, a closer look. Should we do that? Yes, I think let me let me take them back. Let me put them down here. Right, let's get rid of the dung. Oh, hang on. Sorry. I'm I'm just scraping away. I will get to the microscope now. Um wait. Now I've got to try and concentrate here. Oh, no, don't move. Stay. Okay, let me see if I can get this in focus. Wow. Okay. Let's go to the microscope. This is impressive. That is what I'd imagine a velociraptor's claw to look like, <laughs> which is a dinosaur, for those of you who don't know what a velociraptor is. Um, that's not a velociraptor claw, of course. That is the thorn, the hooked thorn, of a knobthorn tree. Isn't that very impressive? Now, that can quite easily make you bleed. Should we, we'll do a little test just now. I will sacri sacrifice myself for an experiment. We'll see which, which thorn is sharper. I think that that is pretty, pretty sharp. Now they've got thorns like that um, sort of opposite each other going all the way up the branches, which uh, is quite nasty. Now you can imagine that'd be not very sort of nice if that hooks onto your clothing. Nevertheless, when it pierces your skin. Now I'm going to trade it because there's another thorn, of course, that I had in my hand that I'm going to put underneath. And then we're going to do an experiment afterwards. We're going to see how this goes. Oh, wait. I have to actually might have to raise this one a little bit. Here you go up a little bit because it's a thorn. No, no. You have to stay there. Oh, no. Stay. Now, this is a tricky one because this is from the buffalo thorn and it's got two different types of thorns. It's got a straight thorn and a hook thorn. So to try and get them in the same shot, trying to balance the stick could be quite tricky. So please just bear with me. No, it has to go up even higher. Let's try that. No, come back into the cam. So difficult. I promise you, you're probably all laughing at me. But it is, it's so tough. No, now that's not showing the angle that I want. <laughs> ah, well, we may have done my experiment without me even asking. Okay, let's do, we, this one's not going to work. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to see which was sharper. So I said this is for science. Um, so on the on the buffalo thorn, you've got the straight thorn and you've also got the hook thorn on the other side. That's why they call it the huck and stick. And you can imagine, now both of them are equally as sharp, but the one that I'm most afraid of is not actually the hook thorn this time, is the straight one, because it's the one that always gets, um, always the one that pricks you. The little hooked ones are the ones that normally rip your clothing. So where are we going to test? We test on my finger. I apologize, my hands are also very dirty. Please don't judge me right now because I was digging. And you can, if you look, look on my table, let me just defend myself very quickly. Look what is here. You see all of that? Dung, antelope dung from Impala to Inyala to uh, Dacre and Steenbork is all on the table. So that's what I've been digging through at the moment. So that's why my hands look like they do. But we're going to prick my finger. We'll just pretend that I'm checking my sugar levels. I'm too scared. <laughs> can't prick it on purpose. I'm a little baby, even though it's just a tiny little pink print prick. So I pushed it in and then it started hurting, so I stopped. Let me just see how much sharper. So it's pretty sharp, but I reckon, I think maybe this could be the... No. Maybe it's just because my thumbs are now so tough from digging in the dirt that my hands have become just one callus and they're too tough for... The, the thorns. Okay, well, that's not working. Oh, well. Anyways, they normally do work. I prick myself on them all the time. Uh, anybody that's come on safari either has, A, been driven through a knob thorn branch or a buff probably more a buffalo thorn tree by their guide, or if you're like me, you just seem to stumble over them all the time. <laughs> Ex 
exquisite bliss. You say that that's a strong word. You say that I'm mutilating myself for the viewers. Not quite mutilating. Mutilating is a seriously strong word. I was just pricking my finger, but as you saw, I was too much of a sissy. What we'll do is the next time I do a bushwalk, I'll just do what I normally do, and I'll probably end up with a scratch or two. Uh, it's impossible. I've got scars all over my legs from the amount of branches that I normally kick back into myself. I think I've actually shown you them before. And like I said, when you go on safari, whether it's a bushwalk or in the car, you, somebody always ends up being tangled in a buffalo thorn. Oh, well, I'm so sad that I was too much of a sissy to do my science experiment to see which thorn was sharper. Oh, well, let's go across to Byron now and... Uh, I'm not sure what he's up to. It's starting to get dark. The sun is definitely set. Is that spotlight out yet? We'll have to go and see. You're just a thorn in my side. That's all you ever were. <laughs> Don't tell James I sang, but I thought it was appropriate because Taylor was testing the sharpness of the thorns. Taylor testing thorns. Not quite alliteration. Oh, Rusty's making funny noises. That's not good. So, we um, just driving around. No sign of those Ellies. I don't know where they disappeared to. Maybe we bump into them. Uh, tomorrow morning, at least, there'll be two of us out again, I, th I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So, uh, Senzo is back from the Mara. Um, so, Taylor and I will be on, on the vehicles tomorrow. What, what's the date of tomorrow? Is tomorrow the, is tomorrow the first? No, it can't be. Tomorrow, 31st. I guess oh, we lose track of time out here. And days. Craig, shall we try find an owl? I was really, I was really upset yesterday with that scops owl. Couldn't believe it. Spotted it and then it disappeared. Machine gun nest. I'd love to see a Marshall Eagle too. We haven't seen a Marshall Eagle for quite some time. Um, I doubt we'll see one now this time of the this time of the evening. But um, but they are around, so maybe maybe in the next few days we'll see one. We'll try to keep a lookout for birds of prey. I was saying the other day uh, or yesterday we haven't seen too many birds of prey lately, but. Then we saw Batalia, we saw Tawny Eagle. This morning from the tent I saw that Tawny Eagle flying over with a lilac breasted roller mobbing and chasing it away. Oh, we'll see, maybe, who knows, who knows. But I'd love to see a Marshall Eagle. It's my favorite bird, absolute favorite bird. Although these little owls are starting to creep in. <laughs> A lot of, a lot of wonderful birds around. Always nice to see them. Let's see. I, I better spot an owl tonight before Craig does. He keeps rubbing it in and he teases me when we get back to camp. It's very awkward in front of all the other staff members. <laughs> There goes a Koran. There goes a Koran. Oh, let's see if we can see it. It just uh, just disappeared. I, you know what? I don't think we're going to see that Koran now. It landed in the long grass. Can you see it? Oh, that Koran was so well camouflaged. I don't think we'll see it. Sinak, you asked what types of owls do we see in the Sabi Sands? Sinak, we see giant eagle owl or the Verose eagle owl, um, or what I learned 
this morning, also known as the milky eagle owl. Um, the milky white owl, milky white, milky eagle owl. It's a giant or verose eagle owl. The spotted eagle owl. We also get white faced scops owl, barn owl, uh, pearl spotted owlet, African barred owlet, and African scops owl. That's seven. Um, I have, we have seen, uh, this was a few years ago, but a grass owl, we did see grass owl out here too, down in the southern part of the Sabi Sands. That's eight species of grass, or of owls that I can think of. Um, trying to think, am I missing one? Am I missing one? Uh, no, I don't, I think that's it. Oh, have a look here. Good evening. We've got someone that's just joined us. Beautiful male in Yala. So eight species of owl that I can think of. Let me see what, uh, let me just double check myself. If you can think of any other owls that I haven't I think that's about it. The only ones that uh, I haven't seen here in the Sabi Sands are the Pell's Fishing Owl, the Marsh Owl, the Cape Eagle Owl, and the Wood Owl. The rest I've seen here, and those are the only owls we get in Southern Africa. So, so actually a great amount or a great variety of owls around. Nice to see these male in Yala's browsing. Uh, sorry, Chantal, you said Ard Laura Moore um, said that this male in Yala has got. Uh, Ard Laura Moore, you say this. Uh, this. Um, in Yala has got sparse stripes, not that many. Well, the males, the stripes aren't always that clear. Um, not nearly as clear as that on the female, but it does look as if those stripes are quite widespread. They, they, um, there's definitely quite a large gap between each stripe. There it goes. There goes another one. But yeah, you know, the males generally, oh Laura, where the males generally don't have very prominent stripes. So, but those ones did look like they were a few, a lot fewer and wider apart, which is quite interesting. There's a hornbill. Sorry, Craig, you're out there. Adele, you asked if I prefer the night or the evening safaris or the morning uh, morning safaris. Adele, I don't know. I get asked this a lot, and I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I I must be honest. I think I I think I prefer the the morning drives uh, generally because the, it's exciting to find fresh tracks and trying to look for animals, and especially in winter, it's cooler. And you get animals moving around for a lot longer in the morning. Although the afternoons you get to stop for sundowners. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I think I think I would have to say the the morning, but it, it's it's difficult. It's difficult. Adele, you asked what my best after dark experience is. Well, that's a personal question. Um, 
Um, no, I'm kidding, Adele. Um, <laughs> best uh, evening experience. I, um, you know what, Adele, I've had. Oh, oh, it was actually uh, not with guests, but with family. We were on safari, and uh, we had. Um, I, I took uh, took family out uh, into the Timbavati. We were staying there, and uh, we had we had four male lions around our vehicle, and they were were roaring all at the same time. And that call, Adele. I, it is unbelievable to hear lions roar, but to have them close up is just extra special. And these, um, these lions roared for us a number of times, and we were basically surrounded by these male lions calling. And for me, that's by far one of the best sightings I've ever had. Uh, just, just because of the, uh, I think the, the, the sound, the experience being there with them, also, because I was with family and friends, it, uh, it, it was just wonderful, absolutely perfect. So, um, and that was, uh, I think, one of, uh, stands out by far as one of my best sightings, not just, uh, not just evening sighting. And like I said, just for a number of reasons, but, uh, but to hear lions calling like that is just amazing, especially when they're so close. And at night, we would sit, so lights off completely, and uh, and listen to these lions roaring around us Craig are you looking for owls? Craig says he's looking for everything thank goodness there were some hyena tracks, a lot of elephant tracks all over these roads, but I haven't seen any elephant yet. Probably moved through here during the course of the day. But there are there are hyena tracks heading down the road too. Alright, well we'll carry on our search for owls and maybe a, a hyena or two. Let's head back to Taylor in the tent. Where's it gone now, Innocentia? Here it is. Okay, hang on. We have a daddy long legs. I found it in one of the skulls. Now, it's a young daddy long legs spider, and it's missing a leg. It's actually quite interesting. I've just been watching how it's very capable to move around without uh, an eighth leg. Are you going to stay there? This is the hard part because it's still alive. It crawls. But it is so beautiful. So let me just try and stay. Stay, spider. Please, we want to see you. Let's see if it's going to work. See, I don't want to show you just yet because it's running now. It's not cooperating. So back now you can see that this is live. Otherwise, I would have given you the phone. <laughs> it's actually quite funny. Let me put this microscope in focus and maybe we'll just see it run across the, across the screen every now and then. It can feature like one of those live wallpapers <laughs> that you get to see. Okay, we're on the microscope. There's no spider there just yet. Go, no, hang on, no, 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 spider, go down, go back in your little plastic container where, uh, mm, no, in you go, no, sorry, it's coming, it will come your way, it's going to go there now, I suspect, okay, I'm going to shift it, sit still, <laughs> here it is, look at it moving around, oh, look at it, Look at that, that's amazing. Do you see that technique that it's doing? What it, what it was doing there, how it was shaking vigorously, so that that sort of gyroscope technique. Now, that's a technique that they use uh, of daddy long legs. This is the underside of the spider, too. This is not uh, the top side of the spider. He's cleaning his eyes by the looks of it with his petty palps. Now, what they do there is they sort of shake themselves on the web. And hopefully the idea behind it is that if they have been spotted by shaking themselves and moving very, very quickly, uh, whatever was trying to feast upon them would then lose focus and not be able to spot it. That is awesome. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'm, ju I'm just trying to figure out how I can angle this even better. It's so hard to navigate. I don't know which way I'm supposed to go. You're probably all laughing at me. I'll get it in focus now. 
Oh, we're just going to have to look at it in the bottom corner like that. But it's very pretty. And like I said, it's a small one. It has lost a leg, but it is doing fine. It'll be okay. And I was really hoping we were going to see it walking around because it's got these beautiful sort of silverish white striking markings on its body. I will release it. Don't worry. I will put it back into its skull where it belongs. I didn't want to use a fully grown daddy long leg spider because it was actually quite difficult to even fit this little thing in in the jar. Oh, I'm just trying to shuffle it around again. There we go. That's how I want it. Now I need to put it in focus. Yeah, amazing. Oh, I really wish it would turn around, but I'm just happy that it is still. How cool is that? I love looking at spiders under the microscope. Now, in Essentia, this is obviously her first time in the tent. Well, she's had th uh, three tents now. And she just said how amazing it was. She didn't realize how beautiful a spider could actually be. I really like that. There was a fantastic comment that you made in Essentia, because it is true. They are totally beautiful. Ah, hmm. oh, Laura Moy, you said that this was a jittery spider. It is indeed. Now, what it's doing now is it's trying to clean itself. Uh, it's You can imagine the type of dust and, and all sorts of things that it would have collected. <laughs> Didn't like that, what, that little bit of grass. Did you see that? Put it in between its mouth. Well, no, won't be having that, thank you. And it's not trying to eat those bits of debris. It's just trying to get rid of them. It was very dusty. Uh, when it came out of the impala skull, I think it was in yeah, it was an impala skull that I I found it in. And then there's also some egg sacs, but we we need to try and dig them out at one point. It'll take some time. Not from the spider, from another spider. Hmm. Now, Jinlin, you're wondering if the leg will grow back on the daddy long leg spider. I reckon. Yes, it will, especially once it molts. Because remember, we've been we were talking about molting with a sack spider. This is a, still a very young one. It's so small. It's smaller than my. Well, it's about the size of my thumbnail. That's including its legs. So you can imagine how little it is. Because daddy long legs have got exceptionally long ne legs, as their name suggests. I think once it regenerates again, uh, sorry, once it molts, that leg will start to grow. How great was that? I'm so excited about that little spider. It worked out very, very, very well. It um, it took a lot of patience and trying to get it to sit still. And at one point, in a sense, it shouted at me. She said, I killed it because it was dead at the bottom of the container. And then I said to her, because this is all, a lot of the stuff is all new. Because you haven't spent much time in the bush, have you, in a sense? Uh, and I'm going to put her on camera as well before uh, before the show ends so you can see what an essential looks like. And I said, no, actually, this is an amazing process where uh, it, it's called death feigning, where they, well, pretend to die so uh, they hopefully that their predator loses focus. And it was amazing. It just curled up into a little ball like that. And then all of a sudden it went, oh, I'm back again. Welcome, you know, the spider show. And then off it carried on, wriggling around. Well, I need to release the spider, put it back in its impala skull where it will be much happier. But thank you very much for cooperating. Let's go back across to Biceps McGee and all the wonderful other nicknames that we get to call him. Biceps McGee? When did I become Scottish? <laughs> Oh dear, Taylor, a tent. Maybe, maybe we should get you out of there. Now, I'm trying to have a look. I've got the spotlight out now. Now there are often owls around here. We hear them from time to time. Just need to find them. Still no sign of bush babies anywhere. I've been trying to look, but no sign. Of, sorry, Craig, no sign of bush babies. Uh, Tucker, you're five years old. Hello, Tucker. Good evening. Well, it's good evening for us. Not sure where in the world you are. I'm assuming you're in the United States. Uh, Tucker, you asked, are there any owls that sit on the animals like some of the birds do, like the oxpeckers? Tucker, there aren't. No. Um, so the owls wouldn't sit on animals at all. They wouldn't feed on any of the ticks or any of the insects that are on the animals. 
so we don't we don't see uh, we don't see owls sitting on the animals at all the owls will perch in trees and they'll swoop down and try and catch rodents or insects even some little lizards during the day they'll try to catch them on the ground and while we were sitting with uh, Hosanna actually I did get to see a little what I thought was either bushveld gerbil or a um, or a little elephant shrew perhaps uh, that ran through the scurried through the grass very very quickly but there was a little rodent that ran through there so those little owls would be looking would be looking for that or those little creatures rather now we looking very carefully for silhouettes Spaz, you asked what species of bush babies do we have in the Sabi Sands? So we have the lesser bush baby and the greater bush baby. Um, or also known as the thick-tailed bush baby. That's the large one, the thick-tailed bush baby. And then the lesser bush baby is the one that is more, more um, abundant. That's the one we see regularly, the little ones. Those little bush babies, those are the ones that we see more often. Oh, it would be great to get a glimpse of an owl somewhere now. Okay, Craig, do you want to carry on checking silhouettes? I'll see if we can spot anything in the bush. I mean, I think it's about time we find a civet or a bush or a honey badger. Now, last night we actually had um, what sounded like well, um, a few little uh, Scots owls calling not far from camp so maybe maybe we can still find one we've got a few more minutes Sorry, I'm just listening. I thought I heard a, an owl calling. So, Craig pointed to the left. And, Craig, it does sound like a pull spotted owl. It's actually, it's a forktail drongo that's calling. And I've been caught out before like that. The forktail drongos, they often give a little whistle that sounds similar to that of the pearl spotted owl but that's definitely a fork tail drongo I just heard a chirp from it now the fork tail drongo they imitate the owls for some reason now Cenac uh, sorry Chantal just give me Cenac's question again please ah uh, yes um, so, Sinak, we do indeed have elephant shrew in the Sabi Sands. Um, we do see, I have seen before, I've been sitting with, with lions actually. And, um, and I've seen an elephant shrew come running past. Oh, there's some bats flying around. But that's not what we're looking for. Is drongos, it's amazing that that whistle that they do to imitate, but then every now and then they give that that um, little like scratchy screech that the drongo gives. Um, it could, yeah, <laughs> it's very strange. Sounds just like a little scops, uh, sorry, just like a pearl spotted owl. I've been getting so tongue-tied with these owls at the moment. I keep referring to a scops owl as a pearl spotted owl and a pearl spotted owl as a scops owl. Just too many owls. <laughs> now this is the tree we saw our scops owl in last night. Now I wonder I wonder if I 
play my call because last night I played the call and um, and the scop cell did come out. I don't know if it was. That's the sound that we're listening for. Scops owl, and then I'll play you the pearl spotted owl for those of you who haven't heard it. That's the scops owl, and then the pearl spotted owl. There we go, listen to this. Now that's a proper build up, builds up to a whistle. Sometimes they'll just do this for a while where they build up and they'll stop but then sometimes they'll yeah, they end with the whistle. Do you hear that? So that's the pearl spotted owl. Captain Awesome, you, say, <laughs> you asked if I can find you a chameleon. I'd love to, I'd love to, but I do think that the chances of that happening are very slim at the moment, with it being winter. They're not nearly as active in winter. Snazzy, generally it doesn't rain in winter, not, not very much at all. Now and then we might get a drizzle if we're lucky. Now the other morning we actually had a drizzle. Um, Tristan and Ali were out on drive and, um, and they had a light drizzle. What was it? Just heard something chirping over here. Um, so Snazzy, yes, the, um, we had had a little bit of drizzle but it's very unusual for this time of year to get any rain in this part of the country it's very dry but now and then you might get you might just get some uh, maybe a day where it's overcast maybe a light drizzle all right well let's carry on our search for these little owls maybe we get lucky let's go back to the tent find out what taylor's up to and is she excited about dinner? <laughs> nah, not particularly though. I love Amanda's cooking, but I'm not very hungry tonight. I think I might give dinner a skip. Anyways, look what I've got over here. Oh, I feel like I'm going to break it. It's quite a heavy skull. I know yesterday some of you were asking about that big skull that had a very big smile. I think, was this the smile you were referring to? Oh, crying its teeth. It must be a sign of agitation. <laughs> Just shakes. This is a zebra skull. Well, we think it's a zebra skull. It was actually, this This we didn't find out in the bush. Um, it was from a taxidermy. But um, it looks very similar to a horse skull. But I suppose they're in the same, well, they're equuses in the end, aren't they? Equited, aren't they? Yep. So, I'm sure it's exactly the same thing. They did say it was a zebra. I don't know if they said Birchall's or uh, Cape Mountain zebra. They didn't really uh, specify but beautiful nonetheless. Let me try and take it apart without breaking it. We'll rest this part, my goodness. But look at these teeth. Remember how we always say that you've got to be careful of zebra? Because uh, not only can a, a lion actually be killed by something like a zebra um, with their powerful feet, but they've got a very powerful bite. Now, they wouldn't necessarily bite a lion, but they definitely bite other stallions when they are fighting. And I'm sure the mares bite back too when they get annoyed every now and then. But look at that. It's amazing. Now, I, I, just to try and describe to you how sharp this actually is. I reckon, if any of you, anyone have been bitten by a horse before, then you'll know exactly how sharp their teeth are. Um, I've had a horse bite me once before and actually drew blood. It was that sharp, made, sharp, made more of a bruise than anything. But very, very important. And then lots of, look at the molars. Look how great. And molars are very important for grinding down food, of course. So there is no shortage of molars. Shall we count them? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So six molars on the, the top jaw on either side, the, the back part of the jaw. And then we've also got some smaller sort of molar-like teeth here. One, two, three, four, five, six on the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, there we go. So that's pretty easy. In fact, so at the back of the jaw, top and bottom, uh, six on either side. It's quite interesting. I actually didn't know this, so I'm learning now as well. And then at top and bottom, uh, closer to the front of the jaw, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then six on the bottom as well. Really cool. I think it's quite amazing. Ooh. Now, Paul, you're wondering if these animal skulls, and you try and realign it again, are quite light. Uh, most of them, not all of them, some of them are quite heavy. The buffalo skulls are particularly heavy, and so are elephants. But I think it depends on the bone dens density. But you can see that, I mean, it's this probably weighs about, I'm just trying to think, how many how many of these could I do, little reps, before my arm gets tired? I reckon this must weigh about two and a half, no, maybe even more, maybe closer to five kilograms, just shy of five kilograms, so about 11 pounds or so. It's not particularly light, but then again, it's not over the top heavy, but... Whew. Let me let me do some rearranging here. Must make it face the right way. Please don't fall off because you will bring everything else down with you. Right, I did this. I was playing here and tried to make a pyramid of bones. Ugh! That's heavy. An elephant as well, but this is the one I'm after. Shall we move the jars? Hey, in the center, because I reckon I'm gonna. I'm gonna knock I'm gonna knock this. Go away, Impala. We not we love you, but we don't want to look at you right now. Oh my goodness! <laughs> this is heavy. This probably weighs close to about oh my goodness, maybe twelve or so kilograms. I mean it's just also awkward to carry, but this is from an elephant, um, and it, I feel like the bone is, is almost not quite petrified, but it, it's definitely, I think, a lot heavier than what it would be. Um, now, to me, when I see something of this size in the bush, I feel like Fred Flintstone has been around, and Wilma had cooked him a nice uh, steak of some sort from maybe a brontosaurus. That's what I always think whenever I see these massive bones. Now, it's actually not uncommon to find big elephant bones and things like that around in the bush. So we're very lucky that, and well, it's not, no, uh, that's very sad. Uh, it's not very good that we see these bones. We obviously don't want to see um, big elephants taken down. They're my favorite animal, of course, but luckily for us, this one died of natural causes, uh, and then we went and collected it. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the tent today, something a little bit different. I quite enjoyed watching those clips. Brings back memories from last year, and hopefully the Ngohumas will return, and we'll be able to make new memories. But I'm going to send you across to... Am I going to... I don't know who I'm going to. Uh, Mara. I am. Oh, that's a surprise. Right. It must be quite dark now in Kenya, so let's go across to him. And I wonder if James is wearing his snazzy red jacket. It wasn't because the chefs had packed us a very pleasant sandwich box. Uh, we had some hot coffee and... I do not believe that it was constructed by someone with a great deal of thought for what its actual purpose was. It looks quite good, but it's, uh, well, leaky, shall we say. We have not found anything further other than many more thousands of wildebeest and zebra, and we're now going to be driving, probably, I would say, until around 10 o'clock we'll get home. We'll do our best to try and find some nighttime hunting action. That's going to be our plan. We'll see if we can't spot some lions on the hunt. Uh, there is something that was hunted and indeed eaten, sort of. Can you see it there, Fergus? Mm -hmm. There it is, everyone. And, uh, well, you see so much just gets left sort of uneaten out here. Now, we only have 90 seconds left, and I don't think that that's a nice image for you to be leaving us on, so let us move on. I do apologise once again. We will do... I mean, Fergus and I haven't managed to deliver one full show at all without being nailed by the rain, so we will hopefully manage that sometime very soon. 
We will also be out pretty much, I mean, you must watch out on Facebook. We will be doing any night hunts that we get. We'll broadcast those there. And then early tomorrow morning, there'll be the same sort of thing. It won't be me. And then I'll be out again tomorrow afternoon and evening. So that's the plan for the week. And then, of course, as we go to Thursday and Friday, we're into rehearsals. And then the TV show on Saturday. So that's what our week looks like from the Mara. All right, everyone, that is going to be it from us. I know it seems like a very short time we've been talking to you. Thank you for bearing with us, and thank you very much to the Juma team for holding the show. I believe Innocentia uh, was on camera in the tent today, so well done, Inno. Good stuff from you and Taylor and Byron. Thank you to all of you for your questions and comments. We will do our level best to bring you something more stable tomorrow. Until then, have a wonderful evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you happen to be in the world. Bye-bye.